Oh, interesting. Oh, I see. Okay, Mr. Marshall, uh, you're recording. You have a quorum. Amherst Media is with us here in the house. Your attendees are coming on in. I am, as we speak, about to also make you the co-host. I think you're good to go. All right. Thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of December 6th, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.37 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by chapter two of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda where the Zoom link is listed at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will, do a, I will ma ma take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then return to mute. Bruce Colden. Here. Fred Hartwell. Here. Jesse Major. Present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Here. Karen Winter. Here. And I, Doug Marshall, am in fact present. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. To the general public, the general public comment item in the agenda is reserved for public comment regarding items not specifically on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. If you wish to make a meeting to, to make a comment by clicking the raise, if you wish to make a comment, uh, click the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, so the time now is 640 and we'll go into the first item on the agenda which is the review the re review and approval of meeting minutes. We have two sets of minutes this evening. The first that we will consider are the April 27th minutes. Are there any comments from board members on those draft minutes? April or September? Did I say April? I said you did. Meant, you I, did. Meant, I meant to say September, so thank yeah. you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, September 27th, 2023. 
<laughs> Still no comments. Ah, Janet. Um, I thought they were excellent and I moved to accept them. All right. Uh, does anybody want a second? Bruce, your hand. I so second. Okay, thank you, Bruce. You just beat Karen to the punch. All right. Um, since uh, are there any last last call for comments? Okay, not seeing any hands. We'll do a roll call, starting with Bruce. Actually, I realized that I wasn't at that meeting. I feel like I was because those minutes were so excellent. So I think formally I should abstain because I there's a full house here and I don't think my vote will be needed. If All it right. is, I'll reconsider. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Fred? Aye. Uh, Jesse? Aye. Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. Karen? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. That's six in favor, one abstention. Moving on to the November 1st minutes, 2023. Anybody have any comments on those other than that they were excellent? <laughs> All right, I noticed that the type on those was smaller. Uh, so uh, they were, I think, uh, probably one of the longest sets of minutes I've seen in a while. So Chris and Pam, thank you for your diligence. Bruce? I move to uh, accept minutes as presented. All right, Jesse. A second. All right. All right, uh, last call for comments. All right, we'll go ahead with those. Starting reverse alphabetical, Karen. Aye. And Johanna. Aye. Janet. Aye. Jesse. Aye. Fred. Aye. Bruce. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. That's unanimous, seven in favor. So that takes care of the minutes. All right. We will now have the public comment period. And I see 13 attendees in the attendees uh, section of Zoom, of the Zoom screen. Uh, at this time, I will read the names that I see on the screen, and then we will solicit anybody that wants to make a public comment. So while I'm reading the names, if anybody does want to make a comment, would you please uh, use the Zoom function to raise your hand? I see Bob Parent, Ellen and Salone, Eugene Gofredo, Farah Amin, Ginny Hamilton, Jess Schoendorf, Ken, Kent Farber, Maura Keen, Nate Malloy, Rachel Loeffler, Sharon Sherry, Tony Shao, and a what I guess is an anonymous Zoom user. And I suspect that many of these attendees are here for the library presentation. Uh, so. All right, last call for public comment. Okay, so the time now is 6.45. Chris uh, or Pam, did we in fact advertise the public hearing for these library uh, hearings at 6.45 or later? 6.35. Or earlier. Okay, good. So we've, we've hit 635 then. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, these public hearings have been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard. These public hearings are continued from November 15th, 2023, and are opened simultaneously for the purpose of discussion. So we have SPR 2024-02, Jones Library, 643 Amity Street, 
request site plan review approval to remove and replace 1993 addition with a new addition that meets current codes and improves accessibility and access under section 3.334 of the zoning bylaw in the BG general business zoning district map 14A on parcel 36. The second uh, hearing is for um, PMSPP 2024-01, same uh, entity, same address, request special permit to continue and enlarge structure with existing non-conforming dimensional setbacks in accordance with section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw. Also in the same BG district on map 14A and parcel 36. And finally, SPP 2024-02, Jones Library 24, or 43 Amity Street, request special permit to extinguish the previous special permit FY90-07 pertaining to the 1993 edition proposed to be removed. Uh, also in the same BG district, map 14A and parcel 36. All of these are continued from November 15th. Uh, any board disclosure since uh, the last, since we originally opened these hearings? All right, in that case, uh, we will welcome Sharon Sherry and her design team. Welcome back. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. Can Pam, can I ask you to let in Ellen Anceloni? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then I'm actually, I'm just going to turn it right over to Ellen. Once she joins us. She should be on her way. Yeah. Sorry about that, Sharon. No, totally fine. It's all good. Okay. Hi, Ellen. Um, if I, I thought that I would just turn it right over to you. Yes, that's fine. Going. Yes, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for letting us come back to see you tonight. Uh, I missed last time we were here, but I'm all caught up to speed. Tony Chow is with me, and we have our fantastic um, landscape team uh, from Berkshire Design here. And we are going to um, address the questions that came up. Uh, we got from Christine, and we're going to do those one at a time. Um, and I'm going to let Tony kick it off. Tony, would you mind sharing your screen? Good to be with you all. And I'm going to share a screen and see if this comes up. And let me know if you see it. Okay. Yes, we do. It's perfect. Okay. Great. So we are going to, as Ellen said, um, directly address the questions that arose from the last planning board meeting. And we're going to just go through uh, slide and point by point. And Rachel and I will sort of share this part of the presentation. So I'm just going to go right at this. And let me shrink the screen size a little bit. Um, OK. So the first um, question related to lighting. And there were some questions revolving around historic light fixtures and comments about them being shielded or dark sky compliant and potentially clarity. And also, does it adhere to town standards and as well as the planning board requirements and zoning bylaws? So I think this also is going to get at how we've addressed some of those questions as well as the issue revolving around the selection of the light fixtures as well um, and the rationale behind that. So uh, I know there's a lot of dense information on this slide, but I'm going to let Rachel sort of give the kind of overview, uh, as it were. Great. Thanks, Tony. Um, so we have a lot of goals and priorities when it comes to lighting on the project, and some of them are inherently in conflict with each other. Um, so I'm going to outline those for you, how we were, came out, came to the plan we have. Um, one, it's it's a it's a trick in, in site design is removing vertical barriers between the front the sidewalk and the main entry, or in this case, both sides, the north entry and the south entry. So as much as we can, we want to avoid having pole mounted lights really close to the building. Aesthetically, that that kind of says you're not welcome here. So um, the second goal is that we um, it's really dark there now. It's really hard to see. 
Um, we've heard comments from lots of different groups and boards that the, especially the north side is really dark and security and safety is an issue. So we're trying to increase illumination to, to safe levels, but not too bright. Um, we also are trying very much to minimize glare and um, and overall light pollution to the night sky using full cutoff fixtures where possible. In the case of our other priority, that can, is a little challenging with when we use the historic fixtures on the historic facade. Um, and then we're using contemporary fixtures where it's appropriate to clarify that this is something new, like in the back. Um, but also in the case of the bollards in the front, the historical bollards actually do not cast enough light to meet our illumination standards. Um, so that's the case where we we opted for a more contemporary fixture, but we're placing it, we're nestling it in the bushes so that um, the visual appearance of it is sort of buffered by the bushes, but we still get that that good foot candle, that good lighting on the pathway so you can see. Um, and then also the other thing we're thinking about is, uh, I know the library staff is really um, challenged with maintenance, you know, as much as we can try to minimize maintenance. So anything that is vertical really close to a sidewalk, like if it's right up against a sidewalk, that can be really hard with snow removal and um, mowing and things like that. So trying to pull pull fixtures out of out of those ways. Um, so in terms of the, the zoning guidelines for the lighting, we are we're trying to not have any fixtures higher than they need to be. So we are using a 12 foot high pole mounted fixture in the parking lot. Um, we're using a 10 foot high pole mounted fixture in the way back um, of the North Garden. And then everywhere else we're using building mounted lighting um, or the bollards where we can't achieve lighting through those strategies. Um, all the lights are downcast. Um, that means that they're directing light down, except for a couple of the historical sconces that are on the front of the library. Um, we feel that we're very lucky to actually have some of the original fixtures from the library still at the library and that um, we're able to find some fixtures that match uh, for, for those areas. Um, and then we're also really careful about choosing fixtures that touch the 1913 facade. Um, we don't want to introduce anything that's modern or contemporary on the facade touching it because that would that so really respect it. Um, so I think that's that's it for lighting. Do you want to talk more about the lighting, Tony? Yeah, I, I just reinforce uh, what Rachel said, and you know, just uh, as a reminder, the fixtures in particular um, are on the building are in this location. I don't know if you can see my mouse circling it, but at yeah. the front of the historic F1, F2, uh, and generally all along here in F3s and F4s, these are the ones that are really right engaging directly on the building. And to the upper right here in the um, image in this location, you know, this is a uh, minor of what we were proposing. The F1 actually is the historic fixture that exists, um, as is the F4. So those will be retained. Um, even though they do not, quote, of course, currently comply with uh, local lighting um, standards, but because they're historic in nature, um, you know, they're, we certainly believe they're appropriate and historic in some ways grandfathered in. And then the rest of the fixtures that are also proximate to that, such as F2, F3, F5, um, these fixtures, again, are simply trying to, um, F2 and F4, excuse me, and F3 are trying to all play in the same language as these historic fixtures uh, that are shown in F1, F4, F5. So I think that, again, we were trying to be in keeping with the, the spirit and character of those fixtures on the historic part uh, was uh, looking to really use the design and image of those fixtures to really complement these historic fixtures. And then everything else, as Rachel mentioned, with respect to the rest of the fixtures, such as the bothered lighting, which is located here. And as a reminder, these are the um, some of the images that previously were shown uh, basically illustrates that most of them are very discreet. A lot of them, in fact, are really almost, um, I wouldn't say hidden, but they're really embedded in the landscape. So it will be very uh, understated as also will be some of the under uh, seat lighting at the at some of the areas under the bench. So those are just a reminder of um, where we are with respect to that. And then again, just the recall that you know Rachel mentioned about some of the pole mounted um, 
you know, exterior lighting fixtures, some of which are existing and historic and others which are going to be replaced. <clears throat> All right, uh, questions about lighting from the board. All right, why don't you go on to the next question? Oh, actually, Chris, I see your hand. Um, I wanted to address the issue of um, the lights that don't comply with um, town standards. And if the board wishes, I know there were some reservations about those lights expressed last time. But if the board wishes, um, the building commissioner uh, had the suggestion that you could approve those existing lights as well as the proposed lights. You don't really need to approve the existing lights, but the proposed lights that are similar to the existing ones could be approved as part of the special permit 9.22, which um, is uh, allowing, um, the expansion, enlargement, and renovation of the existing building and its nonconformities. Um, the advertisement specifically uh, related to setbacks, but you could incorporate um, lighting as well since these lights are attached to the building. So that might give you some um, an avenue by which you could approve them if you ch cho choose to do so. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Tony, could you? Uh... I, I, I maybe lost the track of your conversation there. The F1 and the F4 are existing, is that right? Yeah, so uh, thanks, Doug, for the question. So the ones that are highlighted, F1, in F4, blue. F5 in blue, these are existing fixtures. And the images that relate to that are shown in these small snapshots. Here's F1, F4, F5, so these exist. Oh, so the blue on the plan is yes. what you're talking about. These are the existing fixtures, correct. And so uh, that whole cluster of F2s that's on the front of the building, mm -hmm. those are new fixtures attached correct. to the building itself. Correct. In a location that previously did not have a light? Um. Ellen, do you want to speak to that? It was a light, but it was not in condition to be reused. Okay. And it wasn't historic as the ones that the ones that are highlighted in blue are historic. Right. And just from uh, you know, we work on a lot of existing buildings, and we're thrilled to have these original lights that we can restore for the project. Right, but I'm talking about the F2 fixture, which is a new fixture, mm -hmm. correct? Correct. Yeah, which which one? In, let me just, there's, I'm going to put this on least, a bigger screen. There's four F2 fixtures on the front right. of the building that are not yeah. blue. Those there's, are those are new, new to the building. And there was not a previously a light fixture in that correct. location? Correct. Correct. Okay. But we need, and as Rachel noted in the beginning, the front of this building is quite dark, and we do need to illuminate it for safety in the walkways. Okay. And and as I understand it, the reason that we didn't use a some other fixture in the vicinity is that at least Rachel Rachel had referenced something that pole mounted fixtures are perceived as an obstacle. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the the F one that's there now is not sufficient to for for that front plaza area. It's very much a okay. Um, so we needed the F twos on either side to bring it up to to safe mm -hmm. levels. All right, Janet, I see your hand. So I've been pondering these lights, and I actually thought so. We don't need to approve the lights that are already on the building because they're there, right? And so, um, from when I read the materials yesterday, you're looking for a waiver for the historic looking F2s and F3s because they're not downcast and they don't meet our code. And I was looking, I don't see any place in the um, in our bylaw that lets us waive the lighting requirements there. And so um, I'm not sure how we can give you a waiver that we're not allowed to give. 
And I'm, I mean, I, I think Chris is suggesting that we can go under section 9.22 saying there's a nonconformity somewhere else so we can do it more nonconformities in other places. I don't, I'm a little uncomfortable with that. I'd like to hear from a town attorney about whether we can do that. Um, but I also ap totally appreciate the effort of picking lights that look will look good on the Jones and kind of match what's there. And so I feel a little stuck in terms of this issue. And I wonder, um, you know, if the town attorney thinks that 9.22 can be stretched to include this, I guess I can go along, but I, I, I feel uncomfortable in sort of an expansion you know, everywhere in the building on all different things, like because some part is non-conforming, we can look at all these other parts. But I, if there's some place in the bylaw that gives us a right to waive the lighting requirement, I'm all for it. Okay, great. So if we voted on this this evening, you would be a no until you hear from the town attorney. It's kind of, I, I don't know even how to vote because I don't see the authority we have to waive, so. Well, I, I mean, I guess the question is whether uh, we'd be comfortable moving forward with uh, approving them under 9.22 on the advice of the building inspector. And it sounds no, just, like you, you would not be. I mean, that's that's pretty clear. Yeah, 9.22 is becoming sort of a highway for nonconformities. I don't quite, I'm very, I'm I'm not, I'm comfortable using it if the town attorney says that's fine, but it's it seems like we're reaching to that a lot in ways that seem sort of novel and unusual to me, and I'm not comfortable. Okay, thank you. Bruce. Uh, when I expressed my disenchantment with these surface mounted fixtures last week, it was uh, entirely in relation to their uh, flanking entries and, uh, and, and as people approach an entry, uh, there's a glare potential, uh, not a potential, it's, it's a fact, it's inevitable. But uh, I see that the uh, that the entries so marked are really the existing fixtures, and these new ones are not really, as far as I can tell, related to entries. Um, they will uh, add a, a, a kind. I, I think they're intended to add a kind of sparkle around the facade, and so I feel uh, a little differently than I did last week because of that. So, <clears throat> so I, I, I'm not averse to um, what is being proposed from the point of view that I expressed last week. Um, so far as whether or not we're able to um, um, approve something that's uh, not conforming in this way. Um, I remember years ago when Bob Mitchell was in your position, uh, Chris, he uh, spent some time trying to keep us out of trouble, uh, by which he meant uh, making decisions that would uh, land us in uh, court. Uh, defending uh, somebody who took action against uh, their disagreement, their strenuous disagreement, obviously, with a, and it seems to me, and and this may be just my uh, cowboy cavalier approach to uh, regulatory life, uh, is that this is generally, I think, a positive uh, thing. I can't see that anybody is going to come at us with a lawsuit to, uh, and and uh, although now we are talking about it, so I suppose at least we can't claim that we just didn't see it. But I don't think that this rise, this seems to be such a minor uh, point uh, that that I would uh, certainly, uh, if we feel we need to go by making some special uh, accommodation for nonconformity, I would even be comfortable just kind of ignoring it. Um, I don't know whether I should say that publicly, but that's the way I feel. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. Johanna? I mostly feel similar to Bruce, and yet I am curious whether, like, are there not fixtures that have a historical look and that would complement the existing fixtures that do meet the standards? Like, how much was that explored? Okay. Thanks, Johanna. Yeah, I guess maybe we should ask the applicant for that. I mean, I can imagine that maybe did. the uh, upper half of some of these globes might be coated with a, you know, opaque white or something to keep the light from going up. So what kind of investigations were there for that? I can comment on that. So we did we did a, a lot of research. We have a lighting designer on this project and we reached out to them. In this style of this onion style light, 
we could not find one, right? So we've we've done a lot of digging. There are lights that have a um, a shield above it, but it's they're more contemporary and they're not the onion shaped. Um, and we've explored the option of can we paint, you know, the glass. Um, in that we would void the warranty of the glass and the fixture. So we did we did a fair amount of digging around and could, we're not successful in finding one of these types of lights that is shielded, unfortunately. Okay. Um, at least for the F2 and F3 fixtures that are along the southern facade, um, you know, are 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 they? I guess there's the F2s that are on the that are closest to the walk that goes east and west. Are they providing illumination for the walkway? And then the F2s and F3s that are a little bit further back, uh, yeah, such as those, Tony. Um, are they just providing sort of general illumination or? Are they also related to walkways? I guess there is a walkway there on the west side, and the one on the east side is associated with that service entrance. Is that right? Yeah, I can speak to that. The the F twos on the front or flanking the F one were essential to bring up the foot candles for safety, and the F two to the west of that, and the F threes where the child that's the children's courtyard area. So if there were events in one of these shoulder seasons where it gets dark, but maybe it's still warm enough to have an event outside, um, that's what the F2 and the F3 are for. Um, and the little and the F2 on the very west of the building is also helping with that emergency egress walk on the west side. Uh huh. And and could I mean I guess modern versus historic appearances aside. Could that illumination be provided by the same kind of bollard you're using elsewhere? Um, I think it would be a very different different type of light. Um, I, I think I think it'd be a very different type of light. You by that you mean you would not use a bollard, you would do something else, or just the quality of the light of using a bollard would be very different. I think the bollard would not be what you want in the courtyard area for uh -huh. for, for safety. Okay. So your so we either accept this and figure out or take the risk that we're approving something we don't have the authority to approve, or we ask you to find something else that's not, that is compliant. Bruce. Oh, sorry. Janet. So. You know, I, from what I've been reading um, in terms of the papers we got yesterday, and I haven't had a chance to read the papers we got today, except for a quick glance at lunch, um, I don't think we're going to approve anything tonight. So I, I think it's we definitely have town time to ask the town attorney for a quick opinion on this. So I, I urge us to do that. Um, in terms of like lighting on historic homes, I live in kind of an old house and um, it's like over 200 years old and there's tons of fixtures that, that are historic and downcast. Um, I have never looked for or seen a circular one, but I also, so I think you could get some old fashioned looking lights um, that are, you know, rectangles and things like that. I have one myself that I bought just down the road in West Springfield. And we, you know, we were looking trying to do a simple light that fix, fit, the house, our simple house. Um, but I also wonder if you can just have somebody fabricate a shield and just, you know, put a cover on the tops of those and you still get the round thing, but it, you know, it's just, you're doing the down lighting thing. I would, I don't want to be a niggling nitpicker, but I, I do think that we should not act outside of our legal authority. And if there's a question about it, we have an attorney that we can ask. So, um, I like the way the ones that you picked look, uh, you know, I prefer them. I'd like to see that go, but I just don't want to 
see it go us sitting there saying, hey, we don't really have the authority, but it doesn't seem like a big deal. It doesn't strike me as good for us or anybody. All right. Thank you, Janet. All right. So um, why don't we suspend that conversation for the moment? And Tony, why don't you take us through any other comments you guys wanted to respond to this evening? If there were any. Yeah. Tony? I don't I think I think Rachel presented the oh, rest okay. of the issues um, that address the overall lighting aspects. And I I'm I, I are there any other comments about that? No, we're or... going, we're moving on, Tony. Okay. He said we're going to suspend that discussion. Fine. Okay. So the next part was a question about the design related to the element that is attaching to the historic portion of this uh, element on the west elevation. And some comments was relayed about the, in some ways, uh, design or quality of this feeling a little bit incongruous with the fabric. And was the question whether a curve basically could be reintroduced back that emulates uh, more the characteristic of it, particularly as one looks at the right hand side here. So we restudied this further. Um, and to the left here, this was the previous design that we presented the last time. And then the subsequent revised design is showing this. So I'm going to point out a couple of things that um, have adjusted. Uh, first and foremost, you can see right away that, that the end of this particular element here is now reintroducing the curve back into the shape of the portion of this roof. Um, I will also point out, and you can see here in the plan view, the doorway itself uh, coming out of the children's library is recessed. So there actually is going to create a more pronounced sort of, um, you know, kind of overhang element here that is also in characteristic like here. So therefore, we believe this is now attempting to redress the nature of the fact that uh, the curve portion of the end element of the roof is reintroduced and brought back. And we're also further extending it uh, more here so it doesn't simply look arbitrarily cut off here, but really re-engages the uh, entrance to the Children's Library. So that that is the primary thing that we made adjustments um, in response to the planning board comments the last time. So that curve repli is replicated from the original. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yep. As was requested. Right. All right. And would that surface be the same artificial slate, or would it be transitioning to something that's able to handle the reduced slope better? Um, I think there's a portion of that that's copper right now, Doug. Um, but if, if it is copper, we'll go back with copper. And one of the things that we do have to go, we'll, we'll use both slate and copper, but this detail is tricky and we have to make sure it's watertight. Yeah. So um, it's it's a combination of, you know, step flashing, um, slate and um copper right and you can see dylan's point that's why we have the gutter here yeah, so yeah. that we properly design and detail this so that when elements in water and other things come down this route it is coming to a point which goes to the gutter that then drains off the building it's so yeah this is it all details that we are are evolving uh, on the assumption that if this design is approved tonight and we will proceed to advance it okay great um, just a side question, uh, the window on the first floor that's to the left of that downspout mm -hmm. uh, looks like it's gotten larger. Uh, uh, have, have, have all the windows along that elevation and grown or anything? No. Looks like maybe they did, huh? No, I, I don't believe... think they... Go ahead, Tony. Yeah. I think what 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 has happened in the earlier design iteration here, um, we when we begin to re this is at a much earlier stage yes. in the project, and as we've been working through our construction documents, from a technical standpoint, we've had to resolve issues revolving around floor levels and you know how far the windows off the floor and ceiling height adjustments. All these things, as a result, these are this is even though the design looks very similar, it's a much more advanced level of design detailing. So it has resulted, you are correct, Doug, in a proportional shift. And one of the other things that's driving that too is that we were in some ways creating a, a better alignment on the windows across the entire 
facade. There was a disconnect between the scale of the windows on this element and what we propose on this. So once we begin to really refine in our current design, we really begin to hone in on proportional issues. And, and we do think that in some respect, at least from a proportional standpoint, it is, it is a better proportion, um, even when one views, even though it's a different scale, the proportional relationship of this to this is more in character of that kind of more vertical uh, proportion versus what we had previous, which looked very stubby and short. Mm -hmm. um, so that that is, uh, you are correct, Doug, there is a, a slight change in the window height vis-a-vis -vis this to this, but, that, and that, but you can also see there's a slight shift in this window too, which is adjusting down a little bit. So all of these things, have been essentially evolving as we continue to develop the design. Okay, great. And I appreciate seeing the snow guards. Yeah, yes. Okay, um, any other comments you're responding to with new material, Tony? Or is, have we covered all of it? I believe we've covered the, the part related to this piece of it. But. The architecture, yeah. Okay. There was a question about the grate in the in the rain garden and if that would be safe for say skateboards and people with hills heels or ADA and those great openings are a quarter of an inch so they will be fine for all those users. Okay. And uh, do those little bridges with the gratings have uh, some sort of edge rail that would keep a wheelchair from rolling off the edge? Yeah, we have a, a U-shaped channel along the edge that's two inches high meeting ADA requirements and it extends okay. beyond the crossings and um, for safety so someone won't, won't mistakenly go into the rain garden. Okay. Can you scroll, Tony? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry. This is yeah, getting this ahead. Is sorry. Perfect. Yeah, it's the third part. Sorry. Okay. So, yeah. great. Well, you sure. want to go on to the third yeah. one? So, sounds like there was an opening to do that. Um, okay. This is, this, this is redressing the third item regarding the parking requirements and, and a question related to larger parking around the old site. So I'm going to have Rachel speak to this. Yeah, we, we submitted a parking management plan. Um, I think it was in the day yesterday, um, going into great more detail about how the library will address uh, serving patrons and staff with alternative means of parking. Um, why, you know, looking at the library website and social media and also the physical space, those are three areas, three touch points to communicate. And our strategy is to have this material, including the municipal parking plan um, that shows all, all the lots and all the parallel spaces on display in the library, also as a handout. Um, the library website plans to update also with this information. And then, um, and then social media, whenever there's a, an event or something happening, that um, a link to this information will also be provided. In addition to the municipal parking um, and the management plan we submitted are all the uh, all the bike the bike paths, bike routes in town, and the, the greater regional network of the bike path. Um, and in addition, the multiple bus routes that um, that link downtown and the library to all parts of town that are available too for bringing bringing folks to the library. Um, so the links to that information, the bus routes, the schedules, all that would be part of the communication package that the library plans to have on in physical on site and then on the website and on social media. Okay, so if I were to summarize the, sort of the gist of that plan is to uh, make people aware of the options for parking in the vicinity of the of the library. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one small, I guess, question is the main street lot that you're showing in green uh, at the no, just to the left of, or this to one. the right. Of, yes, that one. I know that's under construction at the moment, and it's getting smaller. So, uh, you know, the size of that may need to be reduced on your graphic. Okay, okay. Chris, I see your hand. Thank you. Um, so this map here is a map that's produced by the town. Uh -huh. And this map is something that I sent to the applicants because it's the map that is the most instructive about where parking is in town. 
I believe that the town will be reissuing a map that shows an updated version of this. And now that the Main Street parking lot has gone away, um, we'll, we'll need to do that. But for now, this is the map that the town is, you know, showing on its website and sending to people. And this is the town's map of where parking is available in the downtown. All right, thank you for clarifying that. I, I thought it was a, uh, a library produced uh, illustration. Janet. Um, I thought this was an excellent um, information to present to people. I found it informative and I've been here for 20 years. You know, it's obvious that we're not gonna get 500 parking spaces on the library. Um, I also thought maybe you could add on these the parking materials that after five o'clock, anyone can park in permit parking spaces because there's tons of spaces all around town that are available after five o'clock and you know a lot of people don't know that and I, I think that would just be another piece of information that you can be in permit parking after five because it's there's permit parking steps away from the entrance to the Jones all right great and sounds like that comment actually ought to go to Chris and the town when you next update your map Uh, all right, um, Tony, you want to go on to the next item? Sure. And again, I'm going to let Rachel speak to these slides. Yeah, so there's, um, as Tony was mentioning, we've been going through the process of refining refining drawings. Um, and one, one change to our logistics plan that we wanted to uh, make everyone aware of is that we've removed the access that we previously showed on the north side of the property. So we're no longer allowing access to the CVS parking lot. Um, that area will be closed with a solid construction fence um, and we'll have signage on the outside letting folks know that it is a construction area and the sidewalk is closed. Um, but as, you, as you've seen before, we have extensive notes about um, where sidewalks are closed and um, where where bike lanes are redirected around the okay. park. All right. So am I correct that all the construction access to the site will be from Amity Street? Correct. Okay. All right, what's next? I, I think that's it. Right, I think that's the last of it. The rest right. is just for reference if we needed it to talk about. Okay. Right. Yeah, that's it. Great. Okay, so uh, Chris, um, you sent a bunch of findings draft and conditions drafts. Um, uh, I, I kind of assumed it was your hope that we would go through those and maybe approve those this evening, um, including the waivers that were requested and uh, anything else. So uh, would you mind uh, sharing your hopes for the evening? Do you want me to stop screen sharing, Doug? Yeah, I think point? you could, Tony, for the moment. Okay, Thank you. no problem. Doug, could... Yes, Janet. Could I ask a question about where the um, during construction where machines are going to be stored or materials? Is that part of the logistics or sure, that... sure. If it's a yeah, go ahead. That's my question. Are so you gonna... may I answer that? Okay. Yeah. Um, I have had a long discussion with um, the building commissioner and also with Bob Parent, who is the capital projects coordinator, and. Many of those things won't be resolved until the general contractor is brought on board, but um, we have developed some conditions, and you may not have seen them because you said you weren't able to read all the materials that I sent today, but we can go through them. So we've developed some conditions to um, help the town deal with those issues of where does uh, staging happen, where is material stored, where do contractors park, where does construction equipment sit when it's not being used, et cetera. And one thing I wanted to let you know is that um, the construction logistics plan that has been presented for now is the architects and, and the town's kind of best 
guess about how things are going to work. But when the uh, general contractor is brought on board, then that contractor will come up with his own uh, construction logistics plan, and he will present that to a group of um, town staff people, including the building commissioner, and talk about it and work it out. And it will be, it will include the town engineer and the superintendent of public works. So many of the details and the final consideration of those things will be worked out. But I think we've developed um, conditions that say what we don't want, and we are hoping that the planning board will go through those conditions and see if you agree with what we've you know, suggested could be conditions to deal with these issues. So, so, right. so on my five years in the board, I've never seen that. You know, we've always known where people are going to park. We know when, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like when Mr. Oblaski had his project, we knew the construction was going to be at, the machines were going to be at VFW. When 11 East Pleasant, there was, a, they had the, um, proponents had an adjoining lot and there was a lot of discussion about how Prey Street would be used and, and things like that. And so I'm a little, so I'm a little, I so I'm concerned about that. And so I'm wondering, is there any chance that the town lot next to the CVS would be used for that? Because it seems like, you know, all the construction equipment or the supplies would have to come in through um, Coles Lane and come out through North Prospect, and then you'd have to cross the CVS lot to get there. And if you don't have permission for that, so is that off the table? Because I, I think that, you know, the VFW seems to make sense to me. You can just stash everybody there and they can move their machines up as they want. But if the town lot is at, at being used, I think there's a lot of logistical problems. And I, I'd want to know that now. And it doesn't seem like something that, it seems like it could be worked out now. If it can't be worked out, I think it's an issue that should come. <laughs> you know, there were so many things in the um, proposed draft permits about like, oh, yeah, later we'll hear that and we'll decide that. And I've just never seen us do that. It's usually we're getting opinions and, you know, ideas and we're looking at the whole project and making sure the whole thing is going to work. So is the town lot next to CVS just off the table? Because I think that's like a whole can of worms um, that I think we need to talk through. Chris? For now, it's off the table. Yeah, I mean, I mean, to some degree, I guess my reaction, Janet, is that uh, the, the projects you cited were private developers. John Robleski owned the lot next door, had control of it. Um, Archipelago owned the, where the pub was, had control of that had worked out easements. And this, this owner uh, is a different kind of entity and doesn't own adjacent lots that it can promise. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm not gonna put words in the applicant's mouth, but I suspect the CVS lot came off the table in terms of the illustration because they don't want to uh, essentially promise contractors that that would be available. Um, and that if a contractor wants to make a deal with the CVS lot owner, that can be part of their, you know, their bid, and that would enable them to maybe reduce their costs. Um, so I'm completely speculating. Uh, I don't need anybody on the applicants team to tell me uh, what your actual motivation was, but that's my suspicion. Um, and this is a different, I mean, it's very common to have preliminary construction logistics drawings in a bid set that, that, that lay out, again, kind of what was described, the architects and maybe the owners, uh, you know, uh, speculation for how you might do it with uh, what resources are available from those two entities to enable the, to help the contractor. And there aren't a lot of resources right here that the town can offer. So I think that's why it's shown, you know, pretty limited. Um, do you want me to respond or do you want to, to go well, to- I mean, I guess if you, yeah, as long as we're talking about this, I mean- So I just, you know, I don't, 
so if if the VFW lot is owned by the town that's available, to me, it's like there's a lot of moving parts to this project, like everyone, you know, sometimes it's Amherst College, sometimes it's, you know, different entities. But to me, there's like things need to be tied down. And so if this is not tied down, I think it has to come back to the planning board to approve it, not just I, I don't think we should let that go. Um, because that's kind of our job. It's like we we collect opinions from the fire chief and all the different, you know, design review board, disability access board, and then we're looking at the pro product project as a whole and and making the conditions. And that's kind of what we. So I just I just thought this well, was a thing. I, don't open. Know, I guess I would say that we. I mean, it's it's quite clear from that drawing what resources are available to the contractor. It actually wasn't super clear to me, and that was what I hope we no, can. Talk about because I, you know, I was like looking at my computer and I wasn't quite sure. Like so, well, so that's like it, it, it's it's the it's the lot inside the construction fence, and then it, and then it sounds like the town staff, I suppose, has have agreed to make a portion of the sidewalk and parking parallel parking in front of the, the library available for access. Um, you know, I mean, we we don't usually have actually have contractors come back and talk about uh, how they're actually feeding the lot or you know managing construction. No, I'm not. Um, I'm. Are they going to store machines in those areas like overnight? That that's what I've well, always. I mean, different contractors may have different approaches. Okay, so that's enough. Okay, but I'm just saying. If it's going to be machines all over the place on North Pleasant and all uh, North, so well, if you know, if, if let's say you know, hypothetically, you know, one contractor might say, "Oh, I've got a lot three miles south in South Amherst. I can put all my stuff. I'll stage it there and I'll bring it up as I need it." And another one might 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 go to half a dozen ho housing houses just down Amity Street and say, "Hey, I want to park in your driveway, and that's how I'll feed the lot." You know, we don't know how people are going to do it, and and it'll have different cost implications for all of them, for each of them, in terms of how their bid comes in. Okay. Okay, Bruce, you want to put in your two cents, or you want to change the subject? No. I, uh, first of all, we should see what that fraction of the draft conditions looks like, because uh, Chris has already said that they've addressed this. It's just that. It's not definitive. And I don't share Janet's concern at all. Um, in fact, I would be concerned if we tried to do differently. Um, you know, it's a bit like, a, I don't know, a Broadway production or some kind of reduction. Uh, you can have the playwright in place and you can have the producer there, but if you don't have the director, uh, you don't know what the play's going to look like. And we don't have the director. That's the constructor. Trying to do this kind of thing without the constructor is lunacy because you don't have the third leg of the stool. The stool's not going to stand up. You have to wait for the constructor. It's it's common sense. And I can't imagine that we wouldn't ordinarily do that. And if we did, we uh, we ought to be uh, hauled to order. Now, this is the way to do it. And we should look at the, con the, the conditions that Chris and Rob and others have put and just make sure that they at least say what's not allowed or protecting the interests of the town and then let the ingenuity of the contract to drive this bus because these people are construction professionals for a reason. They they they're 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 very smart, very clever, and very imaginative. And we can't begin to imagine um, the uh, what this metaphorical play might look like until they get on board. I have no concern at all about this. All right, thank you, Bruce. Um, other other comments at this point, or should we let? Well, maybe Chris, uh, do you want to bring up the, do you want to start with the findings uh, or do you want to start with the conditions? I think we usually start with the conditions, but I don't, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, I don't remember, actually, I don't remember whether we start with conditions or findings. I would be happy starting with conditions, I guess, because that seems to be the topic of conversation, and then we can go to the findings after that. Okay. So let me just, um, 
well, I won't even say that. No. Okay. So let's read through the conditions and we can edit them as they uh, come along. And we do have Bob Parent in the audience as uh, an attendee. So he may have some um, ideas or, you know, um, answers if people have questions. Um, so I'll start reading and we'll see how long my voice holds out. And then maybe one of the other uh, members of this group could pick up with reading if I start to fail or cough, because I do seem to be getting a cough. All right. Anyway. Chris, um, yeah, we'll be happy to do that. Okay. So um, the first conditions are the general ones. The project shall be built substantially in accordance with plans submitted to the planning board and approved on whatever the date is that you approve them. The project shall be managed substantially in accordance with the management plan submitted to the planning board and approved on the approval date. Substantial, does Bruce have a question about these or does his hand well, just- um, Just a, a, a small point. It, it's not small to an architect, but it, uh, but it might be to others. But plans is, I would say documents is the more all encompassing words. Okay, that's a good idea, yep. Let me get my paper copy of this of documents. Thank you. Thank um, you, Bruce. Substantial, this is number three, substantial changes to the project and or substantial changes to any approved site plans or to the exterior of the building shall be submitted to the planning board for its review and approval prior to the work taking place. The purpose of the submittal shall be for the planning board to approve the change and or to determine whether the changes are de minimis or significant enough to require modification of the special permit or site plan review approval. That's kind of a standard one. These first three are pretty standard, as is the fourth one. Um, landscaping shall be installed in accordance with the landscape plan prior to the issuance of the final certificate of occupancy and once installed shall be continually maintained as needed. All disturbed areas shall be loamed and seeded unless otherwise specified. Do um, you have a question? I mean, is that last sentence really necessary? It seems like the site plans pretty much show everything that's happening everywhere on the site. Is this just sort of, if you forgot it's something, you need to put grass on it? Sort of boilerplate, yep. All right, go ahead. Number five, this site plan review approval shall expire within two years of the date that it is filed with the town clerk, unless, unless it has been both recorded at the Registry of Deeds and substantial construction or use has commenced within the two-year time period. Okay. Um, yeah, number six, all work associated with the project shall be completed with the, within 30 months from the date of issuance of the building permit. If more time is needed, the applicant shall come before the planning board at a public meeting for review and approval of a construction and completion schedule for an extension of time. Number seven, the principal use shall remain a not-for-profit library. Okay, that's okay. the end of the general ones. Um, now we're going into the building exterior and site improvements. Number eight, Prior to the issuance of the building permit, the site plan drawings, including all utility work and work within the town right of way, shall be reviewed and approved by the town engineer. Um, this came about because we have not received comments from the town engineer, and that is for a couple of reasons. One is that he received the drawings that were submitted, the drawings and documents that were submitted in September, and he um, was about to review them. And then we became aware that there are changes that, that are kind of happening as we speak. So um, the building commissioner and I put our heads together and we decided that um, there could be a condition in this permit that would allow the town engineer to make his review um, before the building permit is issued. Uh, knowing that the town engineer has been part of meetings all along as this project has developed. So he's aware of all of the issues, all the drainage issues, all the sewer, water, uh, site work issues. And um, we didn't feel that it was 
uh, reasonable to have him review and comment on the set of plans that was submitted in September, knowing that there were changes. Now, the changes are not related to the surface of the site. The changes are related to underground utilities. And um, Rachel gave me some ideas of what those were about. And mostly it's things having to do with sizes of pipes and um, the size of the stormwater detention area in the rear of the building, um, things like that, that the town engineer needs to look at carefully. But they're not things that the planning board normally um, has a lot to say about. It's all underground. So we felt comfortable with putting this condition in here, and I hope that you do too, and I encourage you to um, consider it. So Chris, uh, I guess it occurs to me that one sentence before the, what you've drafted might be useful, uh, something to the effect that the uh, the surface features of the site shall be uh, constructed in accordance with the plans submitted to the planning board, which limits the chain. So, so that addition would limit the uh, site in the, the town engineer to, uh, you know, approving adjustments to things that are below ground. Um, is that reasonable? Or, you know, I can imagine a catch basin might move, which is something that's visible on the surface, but, uh, you know, every, if everything else is below underground, then you're right, we usually don't worry too much about it, as long I, as the town engineer is okay. I do see your hand, Janet. I Can I answer that? I think yes, that... Please, please. Um, Condition three kind of takes care of that. It says substantial changes to the project or and or substantial changes to any approved site plans or the exterior of the building shall be submitted to the planning board. So if there were changes to the surface that came about as a result of the town engineer's review, they would automatically come back to you for um, you to decide are these de minimis changes or are these things that need to come back for an amended site plan review. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, Chris, or rather Janet. So I, I've actually never seen a permit like this, which leaves things open for the town engineer. And so I, I'm, you know, when I read this, I just kept on thinking, well, we haven't heard from the fire chief. We haven't heard from the town engineer. He hasn't reviewed. Um, I had questions. Yeah, I wasn't even clear what the disability access people were asking for. And I, I just, is there a time crunch on this? Because it seems to me that, I mean, I just have never seen us not, hear from the town engineer and all the people listed here before and you know can that get done in the next two weeks so we could you know have a chance to see what changes have been made to make sure the project meets state requirements that the town engineer is okay that the driveway is fine that I mean this is like a whole list of like this person will tell us and you'll listen to them and we are giving a permit saying, listen to them. I just I just haven't ever seen this in five years. And I, I just understand why don't we just wait, hear, for these, hear from these town officials, from these boards, and, and then just, you know, there's there's plenty to talk about without, you know, you know, trying to draft something that is like, okay, if something changes, we get to see it, if it's substantial. And I just said, I don't know, I don't understand this at all. I just think we should, you know, keep talking about the project add conditions, wait to hear from our town staff, and then take a vote. Okay. Uh, Chris, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, there have been cases in the past, and I can think of at least two, um, where the planning board or, or the zoning board of appeals approved um, a set of plans, and then they went back later for review and approval by the town engineer, specifically with regard to drainage, but also with regard to other things. So Kendrick place up in North Amherst, which is at the tip of Triangle Street and East Pleasant Street, was one of those cases where the town engineer reviewed the stormwater management um, proposal after the planning board uh, made its approval. The other one was um, Aspen Heights. Uh, Aspen Heights is down in the valley. It's a kind of a strange name for a 
something down in the valley. But anyway, it's um, the, the development at 408 Northampton Road, which is just on the border of Hadley. And that's another one where um, the Zoning Board of Appeals approved the project, but there were still uh, reviews that needed to be done by the town engineer. And that went, you know, the project went well during construction and there weren't any issues. So we feel that it's um, a reasonable thing to do. And is this was a suggestion of the building commissioner. So I'm just, you know, hoping that you go along with it. Um, if you're not comfortable with it, we'll, you know, go back and have the town engineer review the the uh, plans that are being developed now. But it really, I, I understand from the library and from uh, the architects that they're very eager to get this approved so that they can apply for their building permit. Um, and so we're trying to uh, help them along and make that happen. And we think that these um, conditions are reasonable. They have been reviewed by the town engineer and they, I mean, by the building commissioner, they've also been reviewed by Bob Parent, who is working for the town on all the capital projects. So he sits in on all the meetings with the team. And um, I think it's, it's a reasonable approach. So okay. there is no rush. It's just, there's no like, reason to rush other than they want to get a building permit quickly but they're they still have to go out to bid so I, I just wonder if they can we can wait a few weeks and have all our ducks in order and things like that I feel much more comfortable with that um you know I also think there's issues with the strong house and it's a really tight site so maybe moving an underground thing is going to change or affect something else and I just anyway so I've said enough okay uh thanks Janet uh, I guess at this point, given Janet's concerns, uh, are there other board members who feel the same way? Uh, and if not, then I would conclude that the majority of the board would like to continue going through these conditions and, uh, and then the findings. All right, I don't see any other hands. So Chris, why don't you continue if, if you're able uh, with the draft conditions. Okay, I think we were on condition nine. The final stormwater management system design and stormwater drainage report shall be submitted to the town engineer for review and approval prior to the issuance of a building permit and shall include pre-construction and post-construction stormwater runoff and stormwater volume calculations based upon soil testing results prepared and stamped by a licensed professional engineer. Number 10, the review of the final stormwater management system and required materials shall confirm that there shall be no increase in rate of stormwater flow caused by the project post-construction when compared to pre-construction conditions, and that the stormwater management system is designed in conformance with the DEP stormwater management standards and technical specifications. Both conditions nine and 10 were taken from the Aspen Heights Zoning Board of Appeals decision. Um, number 11, prior to the issuance of the building permit, the site plan drawings shall be reviewed and approved by the fire chief or his designated representative. Again, Chris Bascom, who is the captain in the fire department, who's in charge of safety and um, fire protection, fire, fire safety, um, has been sitting in on a lot of these meetings with the team, the design team, and has been following this project. He, he has not submitted um, comments to the planning board. Um, but he has been, he is very aware of the design and what's been going on with it. Number 12, the town engineer and building commissioner shall inspect the construction of the entry driveway and all on-site paved areas for conformance to town standards. Number 13, all on-site utilities shall be underground. Number 14, unless otherwise approved with the exception of traditional wall mounted fixtures that were chosen to match or be compatible with existing figures, fixtures, all exterior lighting shall be dark sky compliant and shall be downcast, shielded, and shall not shine onto adjacent properties or streets. Is there more to be said about that one? Well, why do don't we, uh, I mean, you want to flag it and come back to it later? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess uh, we did put this aside. And uh, Janet, I know you had some concerns. Um, you want to say something else? So I think you're supposed to turn the lights off after business hours. And so um, 
I know there's some safety issues in the back of the lot and things like that. So that, you know, that's one of the requirements of the bylaw. So. Yeah. Uh, Chris, do we have the sort of usual language later in this about uh, when the lights are on or off? I thought we did, but we may not. So I can include that if we All didn't. Right, so that's a good comment, Janet. Uh, Sharon? Yeah, thank you. I would just like to to comment. Obviously, we'll have the lights on and off whenever you all need them to be. But there are people who who sleep on our property, and uh, um, it, you know, it it it's a very active public building in the center of a, a a very active downtown. And for safety purposes, I I don't think um you don't want complete darkness in between on the western side of the library building the the strong house has a has a porch um that that people sleep on just like the library has a porch on the western side so we have these porches that people sleep on overnight and having the lights there are very important so it doesn't need to be lit up like bradley international but i i don't think you want a dark library you know during off hours that was my only comment thank you all right um, so Sharon, would it be reasonable for us to ask that, you know, I mean, I, I maybe, I mean, it, it may depend on how the lights are managed, in, switched in terms of how many circuits and that kind of thing. But assuming you have control over sort of individual lights around the, the property, can we ask that? you know, that, that essentially the lighting management be, uh, be designed to maintain security while minimizing the uh, presence of unnecessary lighting, you know, when the, when the library is closed, something, you know, I, I realize that's awfully squishy, um, but, you know, I think the, you know, there's a fair amount of ambient light from the street lights. Uh, you know, the CVS lot has lights that are uh, overhead, you know, on all night. Um, so, uh, you know, if we can strike a balance that that may be helpful. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate the squish. Um, I'd love the opportunity to be able to work with the abutters. Um, you know, for example, the Drake is going to be, you know, a very active place nights. And so I think that side of the bill of the library building is going to have life. Um, but again, in between us and the strong house, I would love to work something out that would work for them as well. So thank uh -huh. you for that. Okay, so Chris, I don't know how that conversation translates into a condition, but I know you're good at drafting conditions. I'll have to think about that. All right. OK. Um, I think we're up to number 15. I mean, oh, Chris, here. actually, one other thought is just, have do we ever have lighting management plans? I have not seen one, but we maybe we could Well, I, I just wondered whether that, you know, some I mean, maybe it could just be as simple as a condition here, but if it needs to be more complicated or explained in some greater detail, um, you know, we could invent a, a document like that that, you know, talks about the security needs on the west side and the egress needs on the east side and the, you know, uh, I don't know. We could ask the architect, uh, landscape architect, excuse me, if that's something that um, they could provide and we could put that in as a condition that they provide a, a yeah. lighting management plan that comes back to you for review and approval at a later date. I don't know. I'm not sure. We, I'm not sure how much we want to see it later. Uh, yeah. I, Go ahead, Rachel. I think it's common. It's common to have um, controls that things are dimmed at a certain time, some, some lights are, some lights are not. So they they can be individually wired. Um, I'd like to add too that the CVS lot to Amity Street passageway along the east 
the north and the east of the building is is used almost like a pedestrian street. Mm -hmm. um, so that is also another area that may be beneficial to have lighting even after library hours because that is more of a public way. Okay. Uh, Janet? So it seems to me that, you know, when you have events at night, there's certain light, you want all your lights on, or if you have events in the back, you want all your lights on. And then what you turn off are the ones you don't need for the event, and you just had the ones for security. And so that doesn't seem like that'd be so hard to work out. Um, you know, and, you know, with the Emily Dickinson house, I think they were doing some kind of architectural lighting, but they were going to turn it off at 11, you know, mostly, you know, and then they would, you could do lighting for their events, but also there was a concern about like animals and, it, you know, the changes and things like that. So I think, um, you know, you could probably figure out pretty easily, you know, what lights you need for walkways and bollards or, you know, to illuminate your outdoor spaces for events and then what those could go off and then the ones you need for safety or, you know, illuminating, because I do think it's a very dark area and people do cut through it, but I don't think you need all your backlights on and stuff like that. So I think that you could probably figure out a plan pretty quickly. All right. So Chris, um, why don't you see if you can draft some sort of condition that, you know, just says we want to have the lighting uh you know have have reasonable control of the different zones around the building uh and and that the illumination after business hours should uh meet the needs for security through the site but uh not 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 as not not excessive or you know, less than is probably needed during business hours. Mm-hmm. Okay, right. I think I've got that. Um, are we ready to move on? I think, yeah, I think we were up to number 15. 15. All air conditioning units, communication devices, and all other outside mechanical equipment shall be placed on the roof of the building and not on exterior walls or within windows. Any equipment, whether located on the ground or on the roof, shall be screened from view and noise muffled with fencing, plantings, or other suitable materials following the approved plans dated, whenever the date is of the approved plans, and prepared by Feingold Alexander and the Berkshire Design Group. <clears throat> Is there equipment that's going to be on the ground? I nope. mean, the second sentence suggests there might be stuff on the ground, and the first sentence says everything has to be on the roof. So there'll I don't be nothing know. on the ground. I think Christine's just covering all the bases, just in case. Okay, Bruce. Uh, once again, approved plans. I'm just wondering whether a uh, design documentation phrase like that might be more all encompassing. Uh, uh, design documents. Yeah. And it should really say um, the date of approval rather than the date of the plans. Right. Okay. Yes. Plans approved rather than approve yeah. plan. Wouldn't it be the documents themselves with the dates are on it? I mean, there's there could be several different plans. And if you say the plans that we approve, but there's not a date on it, it'd be I think it'd be confusing to people later on or even at the moment. <laughs> I think we'll have a pretty good sense of which plans are approved, though, if you approve plans yeah. tonight. Well, totally agree with I guess we have I guess we have the packet which has the documents um, and the date of those documents can be found in the packet mm -hmm. did Bruce have a comment about that Bruce uh, no other than to say that I really support Janet I think it's nice to know the specific set by date okay 
So you'd rather have the date of the plans rather than the date of approval. I would expect so, yes. That's right. I mean, Chris, you probably could put both dates in if you wanted. Great. All righty. That would be cover all the bases. Number 16, all utility work and work within the public right of way shall be conducted following the regulations and permits of the town of Amherst. Number 17, all work within the town right of way shall be reviewed and approved by town council prior to the issuance of a permit. I don't know why it says that, of a permit and the start of work. It says permit building, it should say building permit. Is there, um, I'm sorry, Bruce, I'm sorry. Yes, Janet. Is there a, di am I reading a different document? Is this, a, I have one that's dated 12-5-23. This is, is this a document that was sent out this afternoon. It's 12-6-23 and it contains edits from inspection services from Rob Mora and Bob Parent. Oh, so okay. That's why I'm confused, okay. All right, thanks, Janet. Fred? Fred, you are muted. Yes, I am. I'm sorry. Uh, the on seventeen, I was wondering what a permit building was, no, and whether those right. words are inverted. Yes, that's right. Building permit. Sorry. And um, Janet, is that a legacy hand? Okay, thank you. Um, and and Chris. Uh, is it not true that we all the town council always needs to approve uh, work within the town right of way? Um, they do need to approve work within the town right of way, but um, it's really the surface work that we're, you know, concerned about the sidewalk work, the parking spaces, et cetera. We want to make sure that the contractor knows that that work has to be approved by town council before it's done and that's sometimes hard for contractors to know that they think that once they get their building permit they can do everything that's on the plans so this is a document when we when we have our pre-construction meeting with the contractor um, we go over all of these conditions specifically the conditions that relate to when things have to happen you know especially if they have to happen before um, a building permit is issued or before work begins. So that would be, even though it's true that the town council has to approve all of that work, it's necessary to point it out to the contractor. Okay. All right, moving along. Number 18, prior to any work on fire department property, the fire chief shall review and approve the timing and scheduling of work that is to occur on the fire department's central fire station property to reduce any disruption to the operations of the fire department. Uh, what work is anticipated? Just There's utility work that's anticipated between the two buildings. Uh, Rachel is more familiar with exactly what it is, but it's, uh, in my understanding, there's a sewer line that goes through there. I believe there's a water line and there may also be a drain line. Yes, that, that's correct, Chris. All right. Looks like Janet has a question or a comment. Yes, Janet. That was my. That was also my question. I I hadn't heard about that. So so that at some point you'll be needing to do work on their property. Is that what you're saying? For yeah. sure. Yeah. So we early in the process we actually scoped both the drainage and the sewer lines on the um, and they connect the library today to um, North Pleasant Street's municipal systems. So today sewer leaves the library, it goes through the fire department alley out to North Pleasant Street. And the same for the drainage for the library, it goes through through the fire department alley. Um, our team did a, a actual video scoping of the lines and they are they are really deficient. The sewer line is a is a clay tile line that's kind of falling apart. And the drain line was um, broken and really not meeting current standards. So as part of this project, we are uh, replacing those lines with the proper size and the proper material. And we need work in the to work in the fire department alley. So and we're right. talking with the fire department about what their needs are related to that. And that is that um, those requirements are on our demo plans also that the contractor has to notify fire department um, 
and days and prior, and they have to um, get the fire department approval prior to work in that area. So do, do you feel you can do that without disrupting the fire department or any damage to the old building? Yes, I, we, we've talked through, um, there's a plan to show a Jersey barrier placed right on the edge of the concrete pad that's in front of the, of the um, police department. There will be a temporarily um, parking for the staff for the fire department will have to be will have to be managed. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking with Bob Parrott earlier, um, he thought that it actually could be phased into two different phases. So there would be one phase would be utility work and another phase would be doing the surface work. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think we're on 19 now. Um, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall have in place an agreement with the historical society for use of the society's property for temporary construction access to the library's property if the historical society's property is to be so used. Uh, okay, uh, hold on a second. Bruce, you had your hand up. Was that concerning the fire department? No, uh, I, I have a, a question relating to a possible condition, but I think it might be more appropriate in the management plan section. So that's why I pulled my hand down. We'll see. Okay, thank you. Janet, your hand is back up. So I, I this was when I read the original permit that we're going to extinguish or something later, there was a lot of conversation about the strong house. There were a lot of conditions protecting the strong house. There was a requirement that there be an easement, that there be there was an easement between the strong house and the Jones. Um, and there was a lot of concern about the, you know, the the building itself. And so at the last meeting, I had said, have you been talking to the strong house? And so since then, I've learned that the conversations have been pretty recent. And so I wonder if you can tell us more uh, about your conversations or where that's heading with the strong house. And also, do you think you have to be on their land? Because the good part is this new addition actually moves away from the strong house, but it seems like, can you do the construction without going on their property or endangering their building? Like what, what those issues I'd, I'd like to hear more on. All right, uh, Rachel, would that be you? I can, I can try to answer that. Ellen, feel free to weigh in also. Yeah, we are one of the one of the nice parts about FAA's design is that they are actually pulling the mass of the building away from the property lines. So we're actually improving a pre-existing condition. One of the challenges of that, though, is that um, the historical society property is high, and the the ground floor or garden level entry for the library on the north side is low. Um, so we're trying to make sure that we have enough space in front of that lower entry to divert stormwater. Um, if there is snow and whatnot, uh, making sure that water has a, a way out from that lower level. Mm -hmm. um, and then also having space for people to gather right right against the that near that front entry. So by putting a, a retaining wall, we're actually create, creating a new program area just on the north side of the library. Um, that wall varies in height. Um, on that on that side, it's um, you know at its shortest it's two feet tall. Um, but when it gets closer to the building, it's more like four four to six feet tall, um, and that's necessary to meet the existing grades at the property line. And that wall, it um, it means that it the structural the structural supports the wall doesn't fall over into the library property. It's, it has a foot that sticks back into the ground below the below the surface of the grade um, that anchors the wall and keeps it from falling over. So the construction of it requires that the footing for the wall extend into the historical society property. The surface of the wall, uh, it's really and everything is entirely on the library's property, but the footing about an additional four feet down below frost is extends into the library into the historical society's property. Um, if we didn't do that, then we'd have um, a situation where it'd be extremely tight, um, maybe not even meeting code for passing between the, the building and, and that wall. Okay. Um, so ha uh, it sounds like you have had some conversations with the historical society and uh, 
does it sound like you are likely to uh, obtain a, uh, an acceptable agreement between the two entities? Sharon? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, so the Strong House, it, they've been a great neighbor. Um, you know, we've been, we've been at this project for a really long time. Um, and um, uh, Gigi Barnhill, they're the president of their board, has been to all of these meetings. Uh, we recently got a letter, and I think I've it's been forwarded to you. Is that correct? No. Have y'all? No. Doug, have you not seen the letter from the Strong House? I don't remember seeing it, but, okay. uh, you know, things have been a bit of a blur the last couple of weeks for me. To totally understand. So we'll we'll make sure you get the letter. So yes. So the Strong House uh, trustees and the library trustees are uh, in the beginning stages of of working out the easement language and um, and negotiating all all of the requirements. And so it makes sense here that within your you know your requirements. What you all are saying to us is there needs to be. Uh, you know, signed approval between both boards. We need to see the easement language uh, in place before we're going to sign off on on anything. Um, so that makes complete sense. Okay. All right. Chris, you want to move on to 21? Okay. Hey, prior to the installation of exterior signs, the applicant shall submit a sign plan, including details to the planning board at a public meeting for review and approval. Now the applicant had asked for a waiver from the sign plan and had said they would come back later with a site plan review application for signs. So that's one way to handle it. But the other way to handle it is to say, you know, prior to them installing any exterior signs that they need to come back to the planning board to have those uh, sign system re reviewed. That's more typical. Number mm -hmm. 21 is more typical of the way um, the planning board has handled this in the past, but you know whatever everybody's comfortable with, I'm I'm okay with. Okay, um, I'm fine with the way you've drafted it. Mm -hmm. um, Sharon, any objection? Yeah, no, not a, not at all. Okay. okay, all right. For 22, the applicant shall provide the planning board at a public meeting specifications, including material and color, for any amenities such as bike racks, site furniture, and benches for re review and approval prior to installation. They don't have right. that figured out yet. Um, Sharon, no objection to coming back about that? Yeah, no problem. Okay. okay. Um, uh, Chris, uh, I'm going to just mention... The time now is 12 after 8, and we usually take a break around this time. So I'm thinking if you if we go through the next two for the work within the right-of-way, and then we take a five-minute break. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, work within the right-of-way. 23, repairs and improvements to the right-of-way caused by disturbance during construction shall be completed by the applicant, including all costs, permits, and approvals prior to the issuance of the final certificate of occupancy for the new building. Number 24, all crosswalks, sidewalks, on-street parking spaces, pavement and amenities, and the bus stop within the town right-of-way that are disturbed as part of this project shall be reconstructed to match existing unless changes are reviewed and approved by town council. We put that last phrase in, in case the town council decides they don't want a bus stop there or whatever, whatever it is they want to change. Mm -hmm. If they want to change something, then we wanted to have that um, flexibility to have uh, the applicant go to town Chris, council, and get that approval. Is the work uh, at the fire department considered right away? It is not, no. right? No, um, this is or... only Amity Street that we're talking about here. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, all right. So unless anybody objects in the, while I finish this sentence, um, why don't we take a five minute break? Uh, the time I see now is 8.15. If everybody can mute yourself, turn off your camera, come back at 8.20 and turn on your camera to let us know you're back. Thank you.
All right, I just, I can say that my computer is saying that it's now 8.20. So if you're lurking behind your blank screen and can hear me, I guess it's time to come on back. Uh, Chris, I see you're back. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question. And um, at what point do you want to go through the development application report? You are muted. I took a quick look through the development application report this afternoon and um, wanted to see if there were any conditions that needed to be included here that were based on the development application report. I didn't see any, but maybe others did. Maybe people want to take a um, look at that. Yeah, well, I mean, you had a number of things where you were saying issues the board may want to consider. Well, and... one of them was parking and one of them was lighting. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I mean, you know, looking at the length of your conditions document here, we're on page two of five. Um, and the findings don't look a whole lot shorter. Um, if we're going to go through the development application report too, I don't see how we're going to do that this evening. Okay, um, I guess I wasn't planning to go through the development application report unless someone had a concern about it. Um, okay. I, I assume that well, you all read yeah, it the first yeah, time it came I mean, out. You know, it's quite common for us to go through it and discuss each of the topics you've raised. Well, I'd be happy to do that if you all think that would be useful. Yeah. All right. Well, why don't we continue? I guess Fred isn't back yet. And um, let's see if there's anybody else. It looks like everybody else is back. There's Fred. All right. Um, so why don't you continue with the conditions? Okay, and I think Bruce had something he wanted to add to this section. Um, right, to the management so plan. So about, I'm sure he'll raise his hand at the appropriate moment. Okay, so management plan, significant, oh, 25. Significant accumulation of snow plowed within the project area shall be promptly removed from the site as part of the clearing process to the extent possible. All right. 26, all trash pickup, deliveries, the operation of construction, maintenance, machinery, and landscaping equipment shall be conducted during the hours of 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., Monday through Saturday. Exceptions shall include emergency vehicles, snow removal, or other emergency situations as approved by the building commissioner. So this is in the general course of um, operation. It's not related to construction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, 27, the project shall comply with and be managed in accordance with all terms of the management plan. Any alterations to this plan shall be approved by the planning board at a public meeting. 28, no work including demolition on the property shall take place prior to all approvals and permit being issued. Permits should be. Um, right. Stage three. Number 29, the exterior of the property. Uh, uh, excuse me, Pam, could you scroll up? I am. I'm sorry, I was writing. Thank you. Here you go. You're welcome. 29, the exterior of the property with particular attention to the front walks, front lawn, and front planting areas shall be maintained in a neat and orderly manner, free from debris and trash. Number 30, movable site furnishings shall be removed from outdoor spaces and stored during the winter months from November to a, November 1st to April 1st. And this relates to um, 
I think there are going to be some movable chairs that are in the children's patio area and also in a lawn area to the south, uh, let's see, southeast. Um, and there may be also some movable um, chairs at the north end of the of the building. So we we want those to be stored during the winter. And has that um, I guess I could ask Sharon. That's that's fine. You've got a place to store these things. Uh, uh, so this is once the building is is done and open. Yeah. Yeah. Um, OK, if the, if that's normal, I mean, um, you know, right now we we keep we keep our our, you know, like we have a couple picnic tables and benches and things. You want us to put those away? If they're um, permanently adhered to the uh, site, I would say no. None of none of them are permanently adhered, and so no. I mean, if that's what if this is normal, totally. We'll work with DPW. I I don't have any place to put all the stuff. The whole point of it is to be there for people to sit on, and you know, if you because we're in a great location, people want to sit in downtown Amherst, whether it's raining or snowing or. I mean, judgment-free zone, but... Um, so this whatever. is offered for the planning board's consideration. Um, the planning board used to have this condition applied to any kind of outdoor dining, um, but since we had COVID and people have been dining outdoors, even in cold weather, um, the planning board has been less um, vigilant about that or less anxious to have this be a condition. So it's really up to the planning board as to whether they think this is a good condition or not. But, um, you know, sometimes during the time of November to April, things do get to look pretty shabby and um, you might want to have a condition such as this. And maybe it's December 1st to March 1st or something like that. So it's open for planning board to decide what they want to do. All right, board members, uh, any thoughts about this? I guess I'll offer that I I think we could probably delete this. Uh, and, you know, I would be more worried if I were the library about chairs wandering off or something um, than just having some snow on a picnic table or something. Does anybody object to that, to removing this? Let's see, I see three hands. Okay. Uh, Janet, looks like you got there first. Um, I actually have something, a question about um, number 26. So I could just wait until you figured this one out. Okay, all right, Bruce. Uh, I broadly agree with you. I, I think that uh, often, you know, that some of these conditions are put in to make sure that it's possible to do it if there's an objection or something arises. And so it's not uncommon for, uh, in my experience, of these things to have uh, conditions in uh, these that aren't enforced because no one has uh, uh, been Jones enough to make sure that they wanted it. It's good to have it there in the event that uh, somebody might. But in this case, Doug, I agree with you. I can't see why I can't see the benefit. I can't see why it would ever be ex uh, be be driven. So I, I would uh, I would support the elimination of this uh, number thirty. But that's not why I put my hand up. I had uh, like Janet another item that I want right. to add. Then, then let me call on Jesse and see if he has <laughs> wants to talk about number 30 before oh, we go back. I was back just going to gonna agree with you, Doc. I think it should be removed okay. and the library can decide. All right. So uh, let's agree uh, that we can remove number 30, Chris. Mm -hmm. And and now we'll go back and talk about the earlier ones, I guess, that uh, uh, Janet and then Bruce want to talk about. So just on number 26, if, if Pam could scroll back a little bit. Um, I didn't understand the whole idea that um, um, the, ex the exemptions language, it said um, exemptions shall include emergency vehicles, snow removal, or other emergency situations. And then it says, as approved by the building commissioner. And it seems to me that if you had a huge snow or an emergency, or some other emergency situation, the last thing you want to do is like call Rob Mora at like 11 o'clock at night. So I didn't understand why he had to approve of something that seemed, you know, kind of, does that make sense? It might be yeah. picky. I hate yeah. to put the pain on that minute. Crisis. I don't think it needs to be there. Okay. okay. I'm not sure who put that in. Do you want to just take out the, uh, 
as approved by the building commissioner? Yes. Just, mm -hmm. just say exemptions are other, you know, other emergency situations. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, Thank thanks, Janet. Bruce. Yeah, I agree with that deletion as well. Um, uh, but um, I I wonder whether we might uh, consider the need to add a, a condition in, uh, I guess it would be in the management plan. I remember during the discussion of the infiltration chamber uh, uh, on the north side that uh, I think the uh, Berkshire design, I think it might have been Greg Hewson, um, uh, 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 said that it was the expectation of the uh, design team that this uh, infiltration infiltration chamber would be flushed annually. Um, and I, first of all, do I correctly recall that? And secondly, uh, would it, uh, I'm not sure whether I'm asking Chris, I guess I'd ask Chris and, and the board whether we think that that would rise to the uh, level of being uh, appropriately cited as a condition the annual flushing or whatever the word is of the uh, infiltration chamber. I think there's only one of them. So I guess it yep. would be the north side. Yep. Uh, Rachel, I see your hand. Do you have a comment on that? Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to add, so the stormwater management report, which is reviewed by the town engineer, has an operations Man operations and maintenance annual that will be provided to the library for maintaining um, any, I, I think the specifics of that um, should be tied to that operation and maintenance manual rather than pulling out a piece of it that may or may not apply if the system changes. Um, just so, so that we're, we're not, um, we're keeping we're keeping everything together with that operation and maintenance plan. Okay. Um, so Rachel uh, or Sherry, maybe. I guess it, I'm not sure, but it sounds like maybe if we wanted to put a condition in, we would just say that the stormwater system shall be maintained in consistent with the approved stormwater maintenance manual. Uh, I see your thumbs up. Um, so that would be okay from your perspective as a condition. Um, Sharon? Yeah, I just wanted to say again, uh, this is <laughs> above my pay grade, I guess. Uh, if this is normal, fine, but I'm thinking about, you know, all the different systems and all the different maintenance stuff, equipment that we're going to have going on. At what point? Is it normal for you to have a condition? Yes, you're going to maintain this properly and this properly and this properly. It seems like it's in our best interest to maintain it properly. But if this is something that much more special, then, then fabulous. Okay. Does, does my question make sense? Absolutely. Um, Bruce, uh, do you have a thought about that since you brought this topic up? Uh, only that... Uh... What Sharon's pointing out is the obligations of a, a building owner, and uh, and and uh, so the answer is yes. I think. I mean, the fact that this building has got a public, uh, rather interesting and complex public profile, uh, is why we get into uh, uh, doing this kind of thing. But I think it's appropriate, and uh, it's uh, yes, it is in the interest of the owner to maintain their building, but. It's also in the interest of the town to make sure that the owners understand that and are held to account on that. So you would go ahead and add the condition. I would. I, I think the condition has has uh, expanded and and made uh, far more intelligent by Rachel is the way to go. We tie the, this manage. We 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 include in this management plan a subordinate management plan for a specific. Uh, uh, component uh, or a specific set of a, a, a specific subsystem of the building. Yes, I think we should do that. Okay. All right. Uh, Janet. Um, I agree with Bruce. Um, I think it, it'd be, and I, I was, um, especially since the fire station is down, down right, the right. Slope of the library. So it's really in the town's interest that that get cleaned out. And I think it's actually something that people don't do a lot. So, um, but I would, I would in the language that Bruce has proposed 
amended by Rachel, I would say, as approved by the town engineer, because we don't know what that manual is, if he's going to approve that. So yeah. we're fluid state here. Okay. Chris, I see your hand and I see you taking notes feverishly as we talk about this. I just uh, wanted to read back the condition and I think sure. it was Doug who came up with a kind of general condition. Yep. Stormwater system shall be maintained consistent with the stormwater operations and maintenance manual um, or, or plan as approved by the town engineer. Is that what you wanted to say? Yeah, I think that captures captures it. Okay. Um, I'm seeing Rachel nod her head gently. Um, I'm not seeing Sharon object vociferously. No, um, no, not at all. It's great. No problem. Okay. All right. Well, I think, you know, particularly as Janet mentioned, it goes through the fire department. Uh, we don't want to have a backup and a lot of runoff going wherever it would go. Um, so uh, why don't we add that, Chris? Okay. All right, so we so can we're go moving back. on to yeah, construction. We can go back on. Pam, why don't you scroll back down and we'll go on to the next. These are conditions related to construction and normally you skip over these because there yeah. aren't any potential issues. But I think in this case, it's important because it's a site right in the middle of town and there isn't a lot of room on the site and the building commissioner and Bob Parent and I have thought a lot about these issues and so it's worth um, going through it. All right, Do you okay. so you wanna go through each one or do you just wanna highlight some um, especially critical ones? I could just summarize some of them. Um, so we always have a pre-construction meeting with town staff and the contractor, that's condition number 31, um, prior to the issuance of a building permit so that, I. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, we always require a fire ma management plan, um, fire construction management plan, uh, because there are fires that occur during construction and it's hard to know how to handle them sometimes. Um, the construction logistics plan, which we've talked about, has all of these different things in it, A through J. I don't think we need to talk about those in particular. But starting with condition number 34, I think we should talk about this in detail. Um, so condition number 34 starts with the construction logistics plan shall be subject to the following conditions. A, construction activity shall occur only between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday. B, there shall be no parking or idling of construction trucks or equipment in any public right of way. So that goes to Janet's concern about, you know, concrete trucks and other things um, blocking the, the, the roadway. Does, um, does that include the section of sidewalk that was shown blocked off on the logistics plan we saw? No, that wouldn't include that because that's being used specifically for this project. And so it was no so, longer considered part of the public way? So which maybe we should say, except for the part that is blocked off for during construction. And I'll have to think of a better way of saying that. It's except for the part that is included in the construction logistics plan. Or approved by town council. Yep. Um, is that okay now? I think so. Yeah, uh, C, any blasting or hammering of rock or material shall be noticed to the town officials and abutters 24 hours in advance and completed between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. I don't know whether they'll find any rock here, but um, that's something that we always put in. Yeah. D, during construction, this is this is one that we really need to pay attention to. During construction, the construction period, the following requirements shall apply. One, material and equipment storage and staging shall be limited to the following locations. The project site, the VFW site at 457 Main Street. Two, parking for contractors, personal vehicles shall be restric restricted to the project site, the town owned VFW property at 457 Main Street and the town owned parking lot on North Prospect Street, which is also known as the North Pleasant Street lot. 
and the town-owned Cray Street parking lot. Contract contractors may also purchase employee parking stickers, allowing them to park passenger vehicles in marked locations along public ways within the downtown area. Contractors shall not park, park personal vehicles in metered on-street parking spaces or in the town-owned Amity Street lot. Uh, I guess my question about these first two is, it sounds like you're precluding the contractor from finding other private accommodations. Aren't you, don't you really mean that the, the library and the town will only make those resources available as listed? Yes, that's what we mean. So in other words, the contractor could find a private property owner. Where sure, I mean, let's say he are. wanted to rent the CVS lot and, mm -hmm. you know, paid CVS enough to shut that lot for the duration of construction. Mm -hmm. Why not? Yep. Okay, so I will add that clarification. Okay. Number um, three, once if... Uh, Janet? So I, you know, I was I'm looking at the old, um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm looking at the um, yesterday's permit, um, proposed permit, and you know, basically, the old language suggested it wasn't, you know, it was it's in italics. It says once a general contractor has been hired and prior to the issu into issuance of a building permit, the general contractor shall submit to the planning board for approval a plan showing where material and equipment will be stored in stage where, and where construction vehicles will be parked and a plan for parking of contractor personal vehicles. Um, the plan shall be reviewed and approved by the planning board at a public meeting. You know, that paragraph takes care of my concerns and, you know, you know, sort of what I suggested earlier. And, you know, if, if somebody can find some place near downtown, you know, that is big enough for all these, you know, you know, vehicles and all their equipment and their um, materials you know more power to them that's what they can come and talk to us about we don't have to worry about the vfw site my guess is that this is you know these two sites are probably it yeah um, so that's that, the next that's the next condition on chris's draft here oh okay so thank you, thank you for reading that i'm sorry <laughs> I mean, i'm still jumping back because i still haven't read this one and i was looking at this one so yeah Yep. So Pam, scroll down a little bit so we can see item three there. Yeah. So that text exists and it sounds like you're in favor of it. It's a little bit different. Do you want me to read what is actually in this one? Sure. Once a general contractor has been hired and prior to the issuance of any building permit, the general contractor shall submit to the building commissioner for approval, a plan showing where material and equipment will be stored and staged and where construction vehicles will be parked and shall present a plan for parking of contractors' personal vehicles. All right. Uh, Janet, does that seem okay? Got your you know, hand? Yeah. I think we I think we should keep it for ourselves because of our collective wisdom and the fact that we understand, you know, like, you know, my complete respect for Rob Mora, but one of the good things about the planning board is other than our ability to pick nits and it's like everybody has a different experience. So people who live downtown, will understand, oh, that doesn't work because X, Y, and Z, or somebody who's an architect will be like, well, that's going to be a problem. And so I think we should just stick with the language saying, come back to the planning board, um, just to make sure your plan makes sense. And what may make sense to Rob Mora might not make sense to seven people who are ordinary citizens with different professional degrees. And that that's that's the good that's the good stuff that we bring is that we get to look at something and, you know, Bruce is like, that's a weird curve on the roof. You know, it just doesn't match. And so those little tweaks, but I think this is actually pretty significant. I think we should stick with just having them come back to us. And that is the last thing we'll say about construction plans. <laughs> uh, board members, how do you feel about this? Uh, are you okay with the building commissioner or do you prefer that the planning board review this uh, construction logistics plan. 
Don't all raise your hands at once. Karen? Karen. Only to go to Rob Mora and if something is kind of, I don't know how much plan, it's just more efficient to go to Rob Mora. I'm not sure that this is, and, and he would make a pretty good decision, I would think. So you'd support leaving it with the commissioner? Yeah, I think I would. Okay, Bruce? I think I support Karen. I, I understand Janet's concerns, and and in theory, the, uh, the the board might be there. Might be some instances where we might uh, see things better or differently. But broadly speaking, I think the building commissioner is probably going to be a satisfactory route, and it's certainly uh, a whole lot more expeditious. So, I don't think there's enough to be gained by bringing it back to us. So I would support see, keeping it the way it is. Okay, Jesse? Uh, Bruce said better than I would, so I concur with his statements. All right. What did he say? I didn't catch that. Um, Jesse I, I agreed with Bruce. With... Concurs with Bruce, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I assume, Karen, you're done with your raised hand. Oh, sorry. Uh, all right. All right. Um, Let's see, I haven't seen anything from Johanna. And um, I will say, I guess I think I'm fine with it staying with the building commissioner. Um, you know, I just, I don't, I don't look at that many construction logistics plans to feel like I'm, uh, you know, necessarily very good at that. Johanna. I concur with the majority. Okay. All right, well, so Chris, why don't we leave the approval of the logistics plan with the building commissioner? Yes, oh. um, just let me say one thing in support of that um, idea that the building commissioner has easy access to the Department of Public Works, can consult with the town engineer and the superintendent of public works about things that are going to be um, suggested. So, uh, and that would be challenging for the planning board to do. So, anyway, Janet, um, are we keeping or adjusting the language before that? In I, I don't know what the numbering is. It was number two. Yeah, are we are we altering that or keeping that? What was well, the I idea? think I think Chris had agreed with my suggestion to make it clear that we're not limiting the contractor to those spots. We're just saying that's what the public entity or you know the owner is going to make available Did, in the public right? realm that's what's yes. available in the public realm yeah okay and then just a quick question so if the contractors the workers are using a public lot they'll be given like a special thing so they could be there all day they're not like putting dimes in are they um, what we're saying is they can park in certain public lots but not others there's a there's a lot on prey street where they can park and there's a lot behind CVS, which is the town-owned lot. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's called the North Pleasant Street lot, and they could park there, and they could feed the meter or whatever they need to do. They can also come into town hall and purchase an employee sticker, so they can park in those permit sticker, those permit parking spaces that you see marked with a blue sign. I have one myself. Um, okay. But we don't want them to park in on street metered spaces because those are spaces that everybody the, the the public uses and we also don't want them to park in the amity street lot because people go to the cinema and they you know want to go downtown and we don't have the lot in front of the town hall anymore so we want to leave those spaces open for members of the public okay got it all right okay all right number uh, we're up to 35, I believe. 35. It's 35 is just boilerplate, you know, that they have to provide the building commissioner with information about um, the project manager. Uh, 36 is different times when they can't work. And I think I should read through this. There should be no exterior construction activity 
including fueling of vehicles, deliveries, or idling of vehicles or equipment on the project site before 7 a.m. or after 7 p.m., Monday through Saturday. There shall be no construction on the project site on the following legal holidays, New Year's Day, Memorial Day, July 4th, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. And the applicant agrees that the hours of operation shall be enforceable by the Amherst Police Department and or inspection services. And this is one that we added. Um, there shall be no work during graduation for the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, May 17th and May 18th, 2024. Because those um, do, we, do we not expect that uh, construction could go into 2025? Well, we could, yes. I suggest you add those dates as well. I mean, if I added up the timeline that we had in the earlier uh, document about how long it could be before they apply for the building permit and then, then how long the construction can take, you know, it sounded like it was close to four years. <laughs> Right. I mean, you know, 18 months to get a building permit and two years to build the thing. That's three and a half years. So anyway. Mm -hmm. OK, so uh, I do see a couple of hands. Johanna. I'm curious about the rationale for the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and whether it also extends to Amherst College. Amherst College has its graduation on a weekend. Um, so the people who suggested this uh, condition didn't think that was necessary um, for Amherst College. Also, the crowds are, sh are smaller for Amherst College. OK. OK. Uh, now, Fred. Uh, yeah, on uh, 36, um, I'm curious why uh, the uh, Traffic Enforcement Division is excluded from the list of enforcement. Chris? Are they separate from the police department? I don't think so. I think that's they're members of the police department. The uh, meter people are separate, but the traffic enforcement people are part of the police department. Okay. Well, if, if that's the case, I didn't think so. But if that's the case, then it doesn't matter. So did you say, Chris, that the meter folks were separate? I think the meter folks work for town hall. And, for the and would they be so they would not be able to enforce any of this? I don't believe so. No. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. well that that's what I thought. And why wouldn't they? The metered people only enforce um, infractions of meters. So so, so if we might... have contractors parking at meters, which you don't want, can't they get a ticket from enforcement? They could, but that doesn't have anything to do with condition number thirty six. Okay. So maybe we're go maybe Fred is going back to number 34 um, where we talk about where contractors can park and I think that the meter people could enforce that. Okay. Where contractors right. can park. I see what you're saying. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, Jesse. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Question about number 36. Um I'm assuming the Intention here is about noise for surrounding yeah. people living. And if so, I mean, I understand the, the delineation of exterior versus interior, but certainly interior things can be noisy too. I don't want to try and put more limits on this. I was just curious about if that really was the intention that of is why the it's intention. in there. Yep. And so that's why you have the exterior construction activity. The yes, exterior I, construction is seven to seven Monday through Saturday, but there's no construction on those dates that are listed. And why? It's standard. I don't know why. <laughs> Chris, would you like, or uh, Jesse, would you like to allow construction? Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't. If there's not a real rationale, I don't think we should try and slow down anything. Yeah. So we could strike that sentence, Chris. Strike number 36? No, just the sentence that says there shall be no construction on the project site on the following legal holidays. OK. Fred, you are muted. 
Okay, thank you. All right, Chris, uh, I think we're caught up. We can get to 737 or 38 now. 38, the project site shall be fenced during construction. And then the building commissioner asked if the planning board cared if there's screening applied to the fence, which sometimes includes graphics, letters, and messaging from the, usually from the contractor. Mm -hmm. You know, there's sometimes big banners that the contractor puts up and it shows, it might show an image of the library as it will be built, but it might show some sort of advertising from the contractor. So does the planning board care about that? Okay. Uh, Janet. It, it sounds sort of unpleasant to me, but I, I also, I especially think that the fencing facing the strong house should have just be a fence and no big signs. Okay. All right, Jesse. Uh, I guess yeah. If we can choose, I would choose not to have big signs, but okay. Have other people. Sharon. Yeah, just one thing, and I don't have the language in front of me, but the I think as part of the MBLC grant, there has to be a sign saying this project is uh, thanks to all of our elected officials in the state of Massachusetts, something like that, you know, through a grant, through the MBLC. So there needs to be some kind of sign there, but that's different from advertising for the GC. Mm -hmm. Okay. Karen? Um, yeah, I think there, there can be a very sort of discreet um, a sign which just gives, which is informative, but certainly not a big sort of thing that looks like advertisement. Maybe maybe it could be approved by us. They could come with what? Well, I yeah, I guess, um, you know, it sounds like there's probably is some signage required by the, the, the state agency that's helping fund the project. So we could make an exception for that. Um, and then we could, in fact, you know, uh, isn't this site, Chris, within the purview of the design review board? Yes, it is, but I don't believe that construction signs are reviewed by the design review oh, really? board. They're okay. temporary signs. I know there's always a big sign that says who the contractor is, who paid for the project, you know, who the funding sources are, all the different subcontractors and right. everything. So that's usually there. But I think what we're talking about here is those uh, signs that are made part of the screen or mesh. And we've seen them on um, archipelago projects where they have, you know, a big picture of what the building's going to look like in the future. And might it might even say renting in 2023 or whatever it says. But you could say, you know, that you don't want um, large advertising signs on the screens. Right. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, I'm thinking we should probably just say that. Um, Johanna? It's interesting. My my thinking is it's temporary, and I don't feel a strong need to place additional limitations on this. Okay. All right. Uh, Bruce, you, I think your hand was up. Uh, your, the moment has passed. Yes, I'm with Johanna. You are. Okay. So you would favor no restrictions on the construction fence? I think so, yes. I think I'm there. I don't think that's, uh, I don't think, I, I can't foresee a, a problem. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't feel strongly about that. Uh, would anybody strongly object if we did not limit graphics on the uh, construction fence? Could, Sounds like could, Jan. Could we just say, Whoops, you just muted yourself, Janet. <laughs> Could we just say no signs on the strong house, like the west side? Because I yeah, I think that would be just tacky, you know, to have that in this, you know, it's an 18, 1700 building. I don't think it'll be. <laughs> All right. Uh, anybody object to prohibiting on the west facade, the west construction fence, abutting the strong house? I don't see any hands. Uh, Chris, can we, yes. can you draft that? We can do that. Yep. Number 39, appropriate measures shall take place to control dust, dirt, debris, and construction materials on site. Water for dust control shall be trucked in from off site unless otherwise approved by the Department of Public Works. 
Number 40, all catch basins shall be protected from soil and debris contamination during construction and shall be cleaned at the end of construction. 41, no stumps, demolition material, or construction debris shall be buried or disposed of on the project site. 42, prior to and during construction, physical barriers shall be installed to provide tree protection along the limit of clearing line and around trees to remain. Erosion controls and tree protection measures shall be continuously maintained throughout the course of construction. And number 43, tires shall be washed before vehicles exit the site and anti-tracking pads shall be installed at construction site exits. Okay. Um, uh, Johanna. Is there, and maybe we'll get to it, but is there anything in here about dust management? Should that come to be a problem? That's in, in um, number 39. Appropriate measures shall take place to control dust, dirt, debris, and construction. Thank you. Sorry, I missed it. Yep. Okay. Um, number anything, 44. Anything in the 40, next section? Does someone want to say something? Well, Chris, I was just wondering, is there anything in the next section that you think we need to read? Not particularly. Um, number 47 um, allows the building commissioner to impose surety requirements to make sure that the project gets built. Um, doesn't you know end halfway through it's probably not relevant in this case because you know the library will do the right thing but if that is a typical condition that we put in um i don't think there's anything else except for at the very bottom number 47 the temporary access area of the stronghouse museum grounds shall be restored to its pre-construction condition within 30 days of the project completion Okay. Um, did the numbering go backwards to get to that Pam mm -hmm. scroll? Oh, it went backwards. Yes, that should be 50. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Yep. I know this. I did this so many times. <laughs> Janet. I had a question about the surety um, about because we, we had a, a project that sort of just sat unfinished for a really long time and um, on Spring Street. And then, of course, you know, it's done or almost done. And I, I kind of, it, it got me thinking about what would have happened if the owner of that building or the developers, you know, went bankrupt and the building just sat unbuilt and that occasionally happens in different places. And so do we requ ever require a surety that the construction will be complete? Um, Cause we, you know, on the solar bylaw working group, we, we're requiring a surety that, you know, you're going to build your solar field and not just leave a bunch of, you know, sticks, you know, like a bunch of posts out in the middle of a field or a forest. So yeah. it, do we ever like require people to say, put up a bond, a performance bond saying you're going to do the work. And if you don't, we can collect on the bond and complete it ourselves. And then, um, so that was I, one. I thought, I thought that's what this just said. This only covers the uh, landscaping. Oh, is that right? The okay. site, landscaping and site work, because that's the work that is sometimes left undone. Uh, we have not had the experience of a building being left undone. And the bond would have to be enormous to cover the cost of our taking over and finishing a building. Uh -huh. Okay, <laughs> Sharon, do you have, do you have a I'm thought just, about that? Yeah, so Bob Parent is telling me the project contractor will have to be required uh, to have a performance bond to ensure completion. Okay. All right. Great. All right. Um, Chris, are we through these conditions? Yes. Great. And um, I guess uh, at this point I'll ask, is there anything that people saw in the development application report that they would like to talk about? And I'm, I'm just going to scan scan it myself for the moment. I, everything I've seen so far looks like it was covered in these conditions. Yeah, I think I think I think we've actually dealt with most of this. I do see one thing here, Chris, about the traffic impact report and pedestrians. 
crossing in front of the construction site. Um, has that been a topic of conversation with you guys and the design team for that logistics report? It's been a topic on other projects, such as um, 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street. I think it's probably not really an issue on this project. So, um, so all pedestrians will be told to cross the street so that they don't walk on the north side of Amity Street in front of the this is during construction you're talking about? Yes. All right, can, yeah. you, re can you read that um, section to me? I don't have it right in well, front of me. Uh, Rachel, did you say yes? I, I just like to iterate that the uh, logistics plan goes into great detail about the signage. Um, we are putting signage in at the corner of North Prospect Street and even at the corner of North Pleasant Street, um, letting people know before they get to the closed sidewalk that it's closing, it's time to cross. Okay. Um, so that is mapped out in detail in the logistics plan. Okay, so the plan is that no pedestrians are crossing in front of the construction site or Correct. going past, crossing. past the construction site. Right. I so. think that the um, item in the development application report actually referred to the ultimate situation where pedestrians were crossing the driveway and so it wasn't really referring to the time during construction. Rachel is referring oh, I, to the time I see. during construction. Okay. So I don't really feel like, you know, having seven cars yeah, occasionally come in and out of that driveway is really going to cause a problem yeah. and have to be and studied. It, and that, by... that hasn't been a site of a great number of pedestrian accidents. I mean, no. so far. In the past, no. Okay. All right. Janet, I see your hand. In the waiver section, this is a small thing. There was um, a waiver of the vegetative buffer. So when you have, um, you're abutting the RN in the, B, the BG, you need to have a vegetative buffer between your, you know, you and the, the adjoining property. And I just assumed, but I didn't want to assume that the strong house doesn't want to see vegetation along the building. Is that is that a correct assumption? along the west side of the building? I haven't been in touch with the strong house about that. Mm -hmm. But um, in my opinion, it's nice to have that landscape open rather than cut up. It's nice to see the continuum between the strong house and the library the way it's always been, rather mm -hmm. than having um, shrubs or something there. Yeah, it's also nice for security particularly if people are sleeping on the porches. That's true. Uh, Fred. Uh, yeah, I had a question about the uh, area to the, uh, let's see, it would be to the east of the Jones. Um, <clears throat> right now, that's the only HP parking that's uh, anywhere near uh, people going to the, uh, to the Drake. And uh, so that uh, is a matter of concern, I can tell you, for my wife, who definitely needs that space. Uh, is this uh, during after hours, is this uh, site going to be completely closed? I'm getting the impression the answer is yes. Uh, Sharon? Yeah, no, no. Um, just like now, right now, we have two handicapped spots anybody is welcome to use them at any time, whether the library is open or not. And, and, and doesn't, doesn't that apply to basically all the parking? All seven spaces are likely to be available to anybody after hours? Yeah, we won't put a gate up there or anything like that, yeah. Okay, okay. thank and you. There wouldn't, there wouldn't be any enforcement or ticketing no. or towing of anybody parked in that space, right? No, correct. Yeah. And so because the property is owned by the trustees, it's not it, it's not ticketed by um, the town's parking management folks. OK. And, and you won't be, you know, Going. hiring Pat's toe to monitor it and take my car away. No, On, only if you, you know hit another car that's parked there then okay. then something could happen but no. right. I, I was just concerned about a construction fence that might close that access 
Oh, during um, construction, there will be a fence there that will close that access. Yes. Well, so that's a, that's my concern that, that was the uh, question. we're going to we're going to go through maybe an extended period of time uh, with a uh, <laughs> oh, well. All right. Yeah, well. with the loss of a couple of strategically placed accessible yeah. spaces. Uh, Chris, would the town be willing to make a couple of the parallel parking spaces, you know, a kind of adjacent on Amity Street, handicapped for a during a during the construction? The town shies away from making parallel parking spaces handicapped accessible because it requires that you have a, a lowered curb to the sidewalk, and it uh -huh. requires a lot of signage. It's very challenging. There is handicap parking across the street in the Amity Street lot, and that lot will remain open during construction. So um, perhaps you know people who need that type of parking could use those spaces. Um, that, that raises the question um, and it gives me an idea, and that is that at least during construction, uh, the town might make a couple additional spaces uh, available as uh, HP designated, and then you wouldn't have to do any construction if you just identified the spaces that uh, were close to the ones that are there now. In the Amity Street lot? Yes. I'll make that suggestion to the superintendent of public works. Thank you. Great. Uh, Janet. I wonder if we can go to the page 13 of the um, development application report, because there's a bunch of questions that were posed, and it seems like they'd be good questions about we talk about that area that we're talking about. Um, that would have been in the um, November 15th packet, I think, Pam, if you're looking for that. Oh, and well, I guess it was in, it's in this packet, isn't it? Yeah, I yeah, forgot. I mean, I guess I can read the... Uh... It's just about how, like, you know, pedestrian bike movement around that area and how people cross the street and stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's so cool. issues to consider. Any work within the town right of way will need to be approved by town council. We've talked about that. The board may wish to inquire about pedestrian access on the north side of Amity Street during the construction period. Right. We just talked, I guess we just talked about that. Pedestrian, will pedestrians be required to cross Amity Street to use the sidewalk on the south side? I think the answer is yes. Where will the temporary bus stop be relocated? I don't know that that's come up. Will it be relocated? Uh, Rachel, has that come up? Yeah, we, we've talked with PVTA. Bob Parrott um, has been helping with that conversation. Um, and PBTA's current thinking is they may actually temporarily decommission the bus stop in front of the library because there are so many um, close by on Amity Street. Um, but okay. they would continue to talk with the town about that. All right. So it may just go away. Huh? And then will there be a temporary rerouting of the bike lane or will cyclists need to cross Amity Street and walk their bikes on the sidewalk? Uh, on the south side of the street. Well, I can tell you as a bicyclist, I'm just going to ride, as, you know, in the travel lane if I need to. So <laughs> what's the actual answer to that question? <laughs> Our logistics plans call out for sharing, sharing bikes may share full lane rather than having another bike lane just shimming in there. So we have that signage starting at the corner of the North, North Pleasant Street um, all the way through the Okay. Uh, Janet? I have two questions. Will there be any like special painting on the road to show like the, you know, like share the road? There's like in Brookline, they have that when it's the roadway is now used for bikes and um, there's some kind of weird diamonds and stuff. And then also, I, I think I might've missed this and maybe it has been said, is there going to be a temporary crosswalk like painted out so people know like, oh, we have to cross over from North Prospect to Amity and Pedeth and cars will know that? We have signage at every corner. I can show you the, I can show Just, you the yeah. Will there be like paint on the road so cars, you know, notoriously not, there's a lot of signs downtown. Well, I, I, I mean, 
Is there going to be like Rachel, a tech? Rachel, forgive me if I'm wrong, Rachel, but it sounded like at North Pleasant Street, you're going to tell pedestrians cross here at the existing crosswalk to the south side of Amity Street. And then at the same, at the other end over at North Prospect Street, you're going to tell pedestrians to cross at the existing crosswalk. Oh, so, there is a crosswalk. Okay. Yeah. So we won't need, so we don't need additional crosswalks. Okay. Because we're using existing ones. I, I guess that does beg for me the question about the existing crosswalk right opposite the library with the raised uh, platform. Is anything going to happen to that? Will the signage go away? We're temporarily closing that crosswalk. We have signage that it's closed. All right. And is there a sign in the middle of that street? I think there is in the middle of Amity Street. I kind of remember trying to miss it as I missed the pedestrians too. It's uh, it's one of those, it's not permanent sign. They take it out during the winter. You know, some okay. files can All go right. through. So somebody will, you know, Public Works will just remove it for a couple of years. Fred. Uh, yeah, if that happens and if I get the uh, additional HP spots in the uh, in that lot, uh, people are going to need to be able to uh, cross. Um, and the uh, it, it, I think the DPW should be contacted about at least painting a crosswalk, even if it's not raised. Uh, and I'm not sure where to place it, but well, uh, I mean, wouldn't they cross either at North Prospect Street or at North, or I guess that's just Pleasant Street um, at the existing crosswalk? Particularly, you know, you'd cross at Pleasant Street uh, where you, if you were headed to the Drake. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, that's, pro that, I, I guess maybe that's the only option. Uh, Yep. Okay. All right. I thought I saw an, maybe another hand, but I don't remember whose it was. So, okay. All right. So we've been through these conditions. Um, we've kind of talked a little bit about the development application report and people have raised the topics that they wanted to discuss. Um, the time is 9.18, and um, do people want to sort of power through the uh, findings uh, this evening and try to try to vote on this? I'm seeing at least two, hand, two, two heads shaking yes and one thumb to go with it. Bruce, your hand. Yeah. I... I uh... Much and all, that's a, it, it, it's a, a load and we have house guests. I would uh, think that while our mind's on this and while we've got people assembled, uh, we, should, uh, we should proceed. Okay, so that's three. Janet? I'd like to wait to the next meeting. Um, I, I think okay. we're going to take a long time on this. And then I'd like to see the draft conditions as conditions and hopefully hear from town attorney. But okay. All right. Well, at some point, I think we're going to need to take a straw poll on that. Uh, and it sounds like at the moment, there's at least three members in favor of proceeding uh, this evening. Bruce, is your hands uh, back up? Yes, it's it's just a concern that if we stop and then we take two weeks and we start again, that that it'll take us twice as long. We'll have forgotten stuff. It'll be very inefficient, very frustrating, much and all as it's troublesome to imagine that it's going to be a late night. I think we should. And I don't think we need to worry about uh, other reports from other folks. I think we've handled that. I think we just, we just do, we just, we just okay. stick our nose to the grindstone and do the work. Yep. All right. Um, 
Well, uh, I guess unless other members who have not spoken uh, want to weigh in and change the course of uh, the evening, why don't we go ahead and talk about the findings, Chris? Pam, if you could bring those up. And I'm seeing four, three and a half pages of findings. How's your voice holding up, Chris? I think I'm doing all right. Okay. Well, I'll let you continue unless you want to turn it over to somebody else. Okay. So the first set of findings is about the site plan review. Um, and uh, the section 11.24 is the section that we look at. So um, it starts off, the board found under section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw site plan review as follows. Mm -hmm. 11.2400, the project is in conformance with all appropriate provisions of the zoning bylaw and the goals of the master plan. The applicant has applied for a special permit to continue and enlarge the structure with existing non-conforming dimensional setbacks in accordance with section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw. The applicant has also applied for waivers of setback requirements for accessory structures. And I think there were a couple of other things that Janet mentioned something. Waiver. Uh, the the vegetative barrier at the, the vegetative abut barrier. abutting zone RN. Yep. And there was another waiver having to do with lighting in the parking lot, I think. Was there? Uh, well, it had... I, I, the only one I can remember at the moment had to do with the lighting that did not conform with dark sky. Maybe that's it. Okay. Um, the applicant, yeah, waivers. Um, the applicant has requested a waiver from the requirement of on site parking and has submitted a parking management plan to support that request. Um, 11.2401. Town amenities and abutting properties will be protected through minimizing detrimental or offensive actions. As a not-for-profit library, the proposed use is unlikely to create de detrimental or offensive actions. Exterior lighting will, with the exception of historical figures, fixtures, be downcast and will not shine onto adjacent properties or streets. 11.2402. Um, I yes, see a couple of hands, and I, I may have an edit of my own. So, Chris, or rather, uh, Fred. Uh, yeah, on the historical fixtures, um, I think that's not exactly what you want to say. I would, yes. would think of something like of historical and comparable yeah. fixtures, uh, because they are putting some very modern, brand new ones that look historic, but in fact aren't, uh, along with the ones that are actual historical. Right. I guess the other word that comes to my mind is something of a historic character or appearance. Uh, Janet, uh, while Chris is writing that down, what would you want to say? I would say that, um, you know, after hours, um, exterior lighting will be turned off with the exception of lighting necessary for safety. That sounds more like a condition than a finding. Oh, well, I think that's what we- I, I like the wording. <laughs> we sort that's... of stumbled around the wording earlier. Yeah. I can add that to a condition having to- Yeah, I think that was good. I liked that. Hours exterior lighting will be turned off. After hours, with the exception of lighting required for safety or public safety or something? Yeah. I can't write fast enough. <laughs> That's what we have the recording for, Chris. This time of night. Yeah, I'm sure Pam is busy writing too. Um, all right, so okay. Pam, why don't you scroll down a little bit? Mm -hmm. We're on 11.2402 now? Yep. Yep. Abutting properties will not be, will, abutting properties will be protected from detrimental site characteristics resulting from the proposed use 
including but not limited to air and water pollution, flood, noise, odor, dust vibration, dust, comma, vibration, lights, or visually offensive structures or site features. The proposed use of not-for-profit library will not produce detrimental site characteristics. Exterior lighting will, with the exception of, and then historical will also include those other words that we talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, be downcast and will not shine onto adjacent properties or streets. 11.2403, provision of adequate recreational facilities, open space and amenities will be provided because there will be outdoor sitting and studying areas located near or next to the building, including a children's patio located next to the children's section of the library. There will also be a garden area on the north side of the building with accessible walking paths, as well as stepping stones throughout the garden. 11.2410, unique or important natural, historic, or scenic features will be protected. The project will preserve and maintain the 1928 portion of the library, as well as take measures to protect the Historical Society's strong house and property during construction. Several existing trees will be retained and protected during construction. 11.2411, the project provides adequate methods of refuse disposal as described in the management plan. 11.2412, the project will be connected to town sewer and water. The town engineer has been meeting with the design team on an ongoing basis as the project has been developed. A condition, condition of the site plan review approval will require that the project be reviewed by the town engineer prior to the issuance of a building permit and that the project comply with his requirements. 11.2413, the proposed drainage system within and adjacent to the site will be adequate to handle the stormwater. The town engineer has been meeting with the design team on an ongoing basis as the project has been developed. A condition of the site plan review approval will require that the project be reviewed by the town engineer prior to the issuance of a building permit and that the project comply with his requirements. 11.2414, provision of adequate landscaping has been addressed. The project includes new plantings on the site as well as preserving and maintaining several existing trees both on the library site and on the adjacent Stronghouse Amherst Historical Society property. Small trees within the town right-of-way will be removed and replanted at the completion of construction. 11.2415, the soil erosion control methods are considered adequate to control soil erosion both during and after construction. The town engineer has been meeting with the design team on an ongoing basis as the project has been developed. A condition of the site plan review approval will require that the project be reviewed by the town engineer prior to the issuance of a building permit and that the project comply with his requirements. Can well, I can, can I just ask a question about the last sentence on 2414? Uh, are, are there actually small trees going into the town right of way? I kind of remembered such small trees that were farther back from the street. There are small trees in that little tree lawn between the sidewalk and the curb, and the DPW is going to be removing them, and they will be replanted when construction is um, complete. They were newly planted by the town. Okay. Those little trees. Okay, fine. Yep. Great. Um, Back to 2416. 2416 adjacent properties will be protected by minimizing the intrusion of various nuisances. Um, oh, I see. Well, that's, that's so that so I really j just rewrote that to include all of the things that were listed in the zoning bylaw. So it's really the one right below that that we should look at, be looking at. Adjacent properties will be protected from the intrusion of air and water pollution, flood, noise, odor, dust, and vibration through appropriate site and structure design, and the use of appropriate design and materials for containment ventilation, filtering, screens, soundproofing, sound dampening, and other similar solutions. I don't know if right. there's more that we want to say about that. Uh, that covers a lot of it. Pam, I'm gonna want you to scroll that up. Uh, Janet, I see your hand. Um, so we wanna delete it, that that first one, right? Delete yeah. the first one, yes. Yes. Okay. It's redundant. Pam, are um, you gonna scroll? Which way? Oh. Two for one. 
so that 2417 goes to the top of the screen. <laughs> okay, there you go. That's good. Great. Um, adjacent properties will be protected by minimizing the intrusion of lighting, including parking lot and building exterior lighting through the use of cutoff luminaires, light shields, lowered height of light poles, screening or similar solutions. Except for architectural and interior lit signs, all exterior lighting shall be downcast and shall be directed or shielded to eliminate light trespass onto any adjacent, onto any street or that should be or lighting property. Or. Uh, do you have somewhere in this, with the exception of light from historical fixtures or yes. fixtures of historic character? Yes, it's down below. Okay, good. Um, I, I can start at this sentence that starts with all. Yep. All site lighting, including architectural sign and parking lot lighting, shall be kept extinguished outside of those business hours established on an, under an approved site management plan, except for lighting determined to be necessary for site security and the safety of employees and visitors. The exterior lighting for this project meets these requirements, except for the historical, and I will substitute the language that you've suggested, lighting that is mounted on the building near entries and exits which consists of globe lights as shown on slide 53 of the PowerPoint presentation given to the planning board on November 15th, 2023. And then in the notes below, um, there's one possibility of waiving uh, light, uh, those requirements for the globe lights that are near the parking lot, but I don't think that's as meaningful as waiving or modifying them under 9.22. So I would go with note number two. There are existing historical globe lights on the building. If the board wishes to allow new lights to be installed that match the existing globe lights, the board could approve the new globe lights under special permit SPP 2024-01 under section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw and consider them part of the alteration, enlargement, or reconstruction of the existing non-conforming building. The building commissioner is able to support this approach. In fact, he actually suggested it. Okay, so, Janet. So I didn't, you know, I'm not going to say my previous points, but I want to ask the architects, could these globe lights be considered architectural? I remember when we talked about this a few years ago, architectural lighting was like lighting that was like shining onto a building. But I wonder if the definition is broader to just include lovely architectural lights that light the building. Uh, Tony, uh, Tony had to go pick his wife up from the airport. Um, <laughs> Let's just assume it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I'm, I'm Googling it right now. So. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I guess my sense from the board is that we're inclined you know, with Janet, with you as the exception, to accept the, at the the pathway, I guess, that Rob Mora has proposed. Yeah, I mean, I feel like if it's architectural or lighting, they, it gets a pass. And that yeah. might be, I mean, I hate to waive something that we're not supposed to waive. And I, you know, 9.22, I just, it, it's just sort of become this, you know, I just think there's a lot of legal problems with it. And it's just getting wider and wider. So, right. I'm happy to say it's architectural lighting because it makes the building beautiful. It's up lighting, it gives whatever. So anyway, right. and just skip it all. All right. Well, thanks for that legal parsing of the, the wording. I'm trying to, I'm doing my job here. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm trying hey, to do yeah. We so, good? So Chris, so Chris, I think we're we're gonna go with note two two okay and um you know I, I i actually think your last sentence the it sounds like the building commissioner endorses this approach the building commissioner recommended this approach okay so let's use recommended yeah recommended is able to support seems a little bit a <laughs> little bit wishy-washy 
Okay. Um, 11.2418, it's not applicable because the property is not located in a flood prone conservancy district. All right, Pam, we need to scroll up again. 11.2419 is also not applicable mm -hmm. because there are no wetlands on or within 100 feet of the property. All right. 11.2420, the planning board did not choose to refer to the design principles and standards set forth in those sections of the zoning bylaw because the project is within the jurisdiction of the design review board and the DRB has reviewed the project and has issued comments and recommendations which have been provided to the planning board and the applicant has made changes to the proposal based on the recommendations of the DRB. 11.2421, the development is reasonably consistent with respect to setbacks, placement of parking, landscaping, and entrances and exits with surrounding buildings and development. The applicant has applied for a special permit to continue and enlarge the structure with existing non-conforming dimensional setbacks in accordance with section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw. The applicant has also applied for waivers and I'll list the waivers. I, I only listed the setback requirements for accessory structures and has applied for a waiver from the requirement for on-street parking. So Let you're going to you're going to elaborate that the vegetative buffer. Yes, I was I was going to list the vegetative buffer. Um, is is that it? Um, I have traffic impact sign plan waiver of setback requirements for accessory structure. Waiver of sections for lighting, um, 7.105 for lighting of parking areas. Waiver of section 11.2414 regarding the vegetative buffer. Waiver of section 11.2417 of the zoning bylaw re exterior lighting. Those are all in the development application report, right? Yeah, that's a list from page three or the old, the old, yeah, page, the current oh. one. Development application report. Yeah. Okay. Um, 11.2422 building sites shall avoid to the extent feasible impact on steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, grade changes in wetlands. There are no steep slopes or floodplains on the site. There are no severe grade changes proposed other than at the proposed retaining wall. There are no wetlands on or near the property. There are no scenic views within the property. The applicant has been consulting with the Amherst Historical Society to ensure that the project does not have a lasting negative impact on the Stronghouse or on the surrounding property. 11.2423, uh, Fred has his hand up. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, 11.2422, uh, building site, site shall avoid, that's a command. And these are findings. I think maybe you want to take the word shall out. That's actually quoted from the zoning bylaw. It's part of the, um, what, criteria? Yeah, but aren't these findings? So, so you yes. would say this building site avoids. Yes, something like that. Okay. All right, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, the building Fred. avoids, yeah. Okay. What I usually do is quote from the criteria in the zoning bylaw and then say how it's done, but I understand what you're saying. So that makes more sense in this case. Um, oh. 11 point, is that okay now? Can I add something? Um, you're saying there is a severe grade change um, with the retaining wall. And I think you should say the, the, you know, the project shall ensure that the retaining wall, you know, whatever, you know, like, I mean, you know, say that there is a retaining wall that will hold the dirt back. I mean, it'd be a little more explicit on that, maybe. Okay. Well, again, you don't want to put a command in here. It will, uh, rather than shall, right? Yeah. 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 Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, 11.2423 is not applicable because there's only one building on the site. 11.2424, um, screening has been provided as appropriate. The trash area will be screened by a seven foot six inch tall fence and the mechanical equipment will be located on the roof and will be screened. 
11.2430. The site has been designed to provide for the convenience and safety of vehicular and pedestrian movement, both within the site and in relation to adjoining ways and properties. The driveway will provide access for seven vehicles with parking adjacent to the building. Pedestrians will not need to cross the parking area to access the building. Only uh, pedestrians who are coming from the parking lot. Only maintenance vehicles and trash removal vehicles will be allowed beyond the parking area. Pedestrian movement to the front door will be accommodated by a new and improved accessible walkway at, at the appropriate grade. 11.2431, the location and number of curb cuts will be such as to minimize turning movements and hazardous exits and entrances. There will only be one curb cut giving access to the parking area. 11.2432, the location and design of parking spaces, bicycle racks, drive aisles, loading areas, and sidewalks will be provided in a safe and convenient manner. There will only be seven on-site parking spaces. The bicycle racks will be provided near the parking area. Sidewalks are located so as not to conflict with the parking area and the drive aisle. 11.2433 is not applicable. Except for the construction period, provision for access to adjoining properties is not an issue. The applicant has consulted with the Amherst Historical Society to arrange for access during construction. And do you want to mention they've consulted with the property owner to the east regarding egress from the Drake? Yes. Um, I, don't, I don't think they've actually agreed to access, have they? Since we, we haven't read the letter and no one's ever said, yeah, they've agreed to allow access. The well, strong house. It doesn't say they agreed to, it just says they've consulted with. Has, oh, it's consulted to arrange. Oh, it's it's sort of implied that they had agreed. I'm, I didn't quite. It doesn't actually say they've agreed. So they've, been, um, and with the property owner to the east to allow pedestrian, to con allow p continued pedestrian access to the rear door. It's egress from the rear door. Egress from the rear door. Again, during construction. Okay. 11.2434, it's not applicable because there's on, there is no new driveway proposed for this project. 11.2435 is not applicable. Joint access driveways between adjoining properties are not an issue. The adjacent properties have existing means of access from other locations. 11.2436, the requirement for submittal of a traffic impact statement is requested to be waived. There is a negligible amount of traffic expected to enter the site. 11.2437 is not applicable, no traffic import no traffic impact report will be required. Okay. okay, so that concludes the findings for the site plan review. Yep. Okay. So now we have the special permit. Now we have the special permit for the 9.22, which is related to nonconformities. So this is a quote from what the zoning bylaw says. Section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw states, the special permit granting authority authorized to act under the provisions of section 3.3 .3 of this bylaw may, under a special permit, allow a non-conforming use of a building structure or land to be changed to a specified use not su substantially different in character or in its effect on the neighborhood or on property in the vicinity. Said authority may also authorize under a special permit a non-conforming use of a building structure or land to be extended or a non-conforming building to be structurally altered, enlarged, or reconstructed, provided that the authority finds that such alteration, enlargement, or reconstruction shall not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non-conforming use or non-conforming building. So the finding is that the board finds under section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw that the alteration, enlargement, and reconstruction of the Jones Library, a non-conforming building as to side and rear setback, will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non-conforming building because the proposed setbacks are greater than the existing setbacks. 
The rear setback is required to be 20 feet minimum under section 6.141 of the zoning bylaw, where property in the BG zoning district abuts an adjoining residence district. The existing setback is 1.24 feet at the northwest corner. The proposed setback is 10 feet, which is an improvement over the existing setback. The side setback is required to be 20 feet minimum under section 6.132 of the zoning bylaw, where a property in the BG zoning district abuts an adjoining residence district. The existing setback is 1.24 feet at the northwest corner, and the proposed setback is 5.5 feet, which is an improvement over the existing setback. All right, and is it is it really just a accident of the universe that both of those numbers are the same? That's the information that I've received from the applicant. Is and that Rachel correct? nods her head yes. I checked it twice. I was like, how can that be possible? Okay, thank you. 1.24, not even 1.25. All right. And then Go if ahead. you choose to accept this one, findings for the new historical globe lights at entryways, the board finds under section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw that the addition of new, histor new uh, historically similar or whatever yeah. globe lights mounted on the building that are not shielded or dark sky compliant mm -hmm are not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than, than. the existing non-conforming historical globe lights because they are located at doorway entrances and are not immediately adjacent to neighboring properties or streets. Is that okay? Well, I, I would probably stop the sentence at after lights and forget everything after because okay. some of those lights are not at doorways, and some of them are immediately adjacent to neighborhood neighboring properties. Okay. And the um, special permit findings for the special permit to extinguish the special permit ZBA 90-7 does not need any findings. I checked with Rob Mora about that, and he said no findings are required to extinguish that special permit. Okay. But there are conditions that I suggested, and those conditions are included in a um, an email that I sent out. I'm sorry mm -hmm. that I bombarded you with so many things this afternoon, but Oops. um, I don't know if Pam has access to that email. Yeah, it I'm gonna, from I'm going to try and pull it up. I mean, I have 47 it p.m. Yeah, I have it. Yeah. Okay, there you go. You know, Chris, I, I actually think um, it wouldn't be a bad idea to follow up with the town attorney about about the avenues we have to waive the lighting requirements. I you know, I think in the end, even if we steam steam ahead with what we're doing tonight, um I think Janet's, you know, Janet, uh, Janet's point is reasonable, and I think it it would be helpful to know that there is an avenue in our bylaw. Okay. Just as a, you know, when you're talking to him about something else. Mm -hmm. um, Janet. So. so 9.22 allows you to take a non-conforming building um, and alter it, enlarge it, or reconstruct it as long as it's not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing building. It has nothing to do with lights on the building. It's talking about the, you know, it's talking about their in alteration, enlargement, or reconstruction. So that's what we're that's what the Jones is doing. It's you know taking the you know, the addition down and adding a new addition, they're both non-conforming. That's what 922 is about, to add lighting features. It's just, to me, it's just like the door keeps on opening and I just, I don't get it. I, I just can't support it. And I, you know, I keep on, and then it seems like even if you had a non-conforming use and it's, you know, five stories instead of one story in a previous building, that was fine too. Like everything's fine, but at least in the previous building, it was a building and it was the reconstruction expansion or not. 
here we're just talking about a bunch of lights. And so now we're saying, okay, we can waive any requirement that is a shell because yeah. it's pointed to. And I'm, I just don't get it. So, I'm, you know, All right. All right. I'd like to vote for this and say yes. Yeah. Chris? Well, I think that the light, the building already has these lights that are very similar to what are being proposed. And so what you're doing is you're adding to the number of lights, but the lights are similar to the non-conforming lights that already exist there. So I think right. it's well within the confines of section 9.22 to approve this. Okay. Okay. All right. So. All right, so you have some. So these are um, conditions that you might consider for the extinguishment of the special permit. I spoke with Rob this afternoon, the building commissioner about this. Um, so you might consider these conditions. This special permit, SP 2024-2, to extinguish ZBA 90-7, becomes effective upon the applicant exercising the site plan review and special permit that replace it, allowing the new building to be built. Okay. Two, if the applicant does not build the new building project and does not exercise those two permits, then the special permit CBA 97 does not become extinguished, but remains in place because it will continue to govern the existing building. So in other words, if you don't take the existing building down and replace it with something else, then you need CBA 90-7 to um, mm -hmm allow the existing building to remain if you extinguish it then it makes the you know existing building non-compliant so these are um conditions that we're offering for your con consideration okay all right so are we we are we through everything at this point yes all right so if i were to start to cobble together a motion um, it would be something like uh, we moved that the the findings. Well, I let's think, see. So we've got three. Me. We've got three permits. We we we've we're we're going to move that the site plan review be approved with the findings and uh, conditions drafted by Chris. That the Special permit uh, point zero one under nine point two two be approved, and no conditions or findings are required. And that site plan uh, special permit number two for extinguishment extinguishment of the special permit ninety dash seven. Um, shall be subject to the following, to the two conditions, uh, you know, described in this meeting this evening. And there are findings related to this uh, special permit on 9.22, right? Okay. But no findings related to the special permit on 90-7. So okay, so nine no, so we have findings but no conditions for twenty twenty four dash zero one, and we have no findings, but we do have conditions for twenty twenty four dash zero two. Yes, that's right. And we have both findings and conditions for the site plan review. That's correct of whatever then, number it is, I don't remember. And then you need to say the waivers. It includes the waivers. Yeah, so, uh, you know. You don't have to list the waivers. You can just say that they were the ones that were requested. OK, and we don't need to reference which section of the, of the bylaw each waiver goes with. You don't always do that. It looks like Janet has a different opinion. So. Well, yeah, Janet, yeah. what's your comment, Janet? My comment is I hope we just do this one by one, not as a bulky motion, because I, I don't think I'll intellectually be able to understand what I'm voting on or whatever. If we Oh, okay. 
Yeah. I think it's like too much to pack in. But that's what we normally do. We do it one by one. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll have four four motions, one for waivers, one for site plan review, one for special permit one, and one for special permit four two. Is that I right? Think, I think all the waivers relate to the site plan review. So okay. you can include, include the waivers with the site plan review. All right. Uh, so you only so have what? three motions. We have right. to close the public hearing. And close the public hearing oh, for each good. one. Bruce, thank you. We always I always forget that at least. All right. Um, all right. So so motion one moved that the site plan review 2024-02 with its findings and conditions as uh, discussed and edited this evening, be approved. With the waivers. With the waivers. Uh, as requested. In, as requested. And close the public hearing. And close the public hearing. For the site plan review. Yep. OK. Bruce, you got your hand. You want to make a motion? So moved. All right, Karen, you got second dibs here. Second. And that leaves Johanna to put her hand down. <laughs> okay. Uh, any any comment on this? I, I, I think I ought to give the stalwart members of the public who have been sitting through this a chance to make a comment before we close the hearing. So I see eight members of the public who've hung in there. Anybody want to say anything? Uh, OK, the person identified as Zoom user has their hand up. Uh, Pam, if you could bring her or him in. And please give us your full name and your street address if it's in Amherst. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry that I don't know why it's saying Zoom. It's Jennifer Taub <laughs> at 259 Lincoln. And I didn't know if this is the appropriate time. It's just a small request, but um I was a little concerned for the residents on North Prospect Street and the part of Amity that's close to the library that um you waived that they'll still be able to have construction during holidays like New Year's, Memorial Day, Labor Day. Um and I know it's probably unlikely that a contractor would have his workers working then, but I'm concerned that maybe for the residents that live particularly along North Prospect, that might be an inconvenience for them. So I don't know if it's something you can think about or take into consideration, or you'd have to change it now before you vote. If, if that All right. All right. Helps. So thank, thank you. you, Jennifer. Um, I, you know, I guess I will say that I think the way we left it, that uh, the detrimental effects of exterior construction were going to need to be governed and limited to specific hours and days of the week. Um, but we got rid of the holidays uh, so that interior construction could continue. Uh, if that was deemed necessary by the contractor. Um, and whether the interior construction on a holiday would be detrimental to the neighbors, I guess, uh, I guess it was my kind of understanding that it probably wouldn't be. Um, I guess, uh, Chris, would we maybe consider Ex, you know, limiting exterior construction on holidays? And should we go back and think about that? I think that would be a good idea. This is sort of a standard condition that you have for all big projects. So uh -huh. I think it would be better to leave it in and say no exterior construction on the project right. site. In these so what, what it previously said was just no construction. Yeah. So if we added the word exterior, maybe that would protect the uh, butters. Bruce? I just wanted to say that I would accept that as a friendly amendment. 
Okay, thank you, Bruce. And Karen was our second. You, could you accept that as a friend? I, I second it. I second okay. it. Okay, all right. I'm sorry, are we voting to close the hearing or what are we voting on? I, well, we, we have a motion on the table to uh, accept, you know, uh, approve the site plan review with the findings and the conditions and the waivers and to close the hearing. Uh, that motion is on the floor. Um, and, and having just heard this public comment, I think we're, we've now amended the motion to add the word exterior before the, you know, in, and, and, rest, and restore the sentence about having uh, no construction on holidays. And so uh, that's where we're at. Okay, I can see you mouthing, thank you. <laughs> okay, all right, so thank you, Jennifer. I think that was a, a good addition. Um, I don't see any other hands from the public at this point. So uh, I guess we will go ahead and do any other members of the board wanna say anything else before we vote on the motion? Okay. Um, so we'll go through the motion with a roll call. Uh, I, I think, I hope everybody's clear. This is about the site plan review. Um, so uh, Bruce. Hi. All right. Uh, Fred. Aye. Jesse. Aye. Janet. Abstain. All right, Johanna. Aye. Karen. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. All right, that's six in favor, one abstention. Um, I guess we can move on to the next uh, motion, which I believe is SPR or Special Permit 20, 24-01. Let's see, was this the one with the, this is the one with findings and no conditions, is that right? That's correct. So so we would move that the, that special permit be approved with the findings and that the special, that the uh, public hearing be closed. So I have a question about this one. Yeah. Um, are we including the lighting in this? As was suggested in I'm losing track of all my papers here. Yeah, and I don't see it. I don't see it on the screen anymore, so I'm having trouble conceptualizing it. There was a finding related to section 9.22, which talked about um Findings for the new historical globe lights at the entryways. It's um, with the other findings, I think. Let's see. Oh, okay. So these are conditions. Yeah. So go back to the findings and go all the way down to the bottom. Um, yeah, there it is. Okay, so we had a draft finding related to the new historical globe lights. The board yeah, funds. and this so this was the I think Bruce was the one that said, well, you know, we might just ignore the whole thing um, and not highlight it with a part of with a finding. But uh, you know, I think I think obviously we've talked a lot about this. This seems to be the avenue that we've uh, adopted. Um, we've mentioned that the building official, recommended this approach. So I would include the findings. Bruce? Yes, I was going to move uh, uh, acceptance or approval of the application for um, SP24, uh, 2024-1, which is, I guess, the one above here. That's the number with the findings as uh, presented uh, by the uh, planning director and and uh, 
amended during the uh, the review of the board and uh close the hearing no there and uh, there be no there, there be no conditions and to close the hearing okay um johanna you got the yeah i was going to second the motion okay thank you um so at this point uh i guess i will also ask the public any comments from the public for this topic I'm not seeing any okay all right um any more comments from the board before we run through the roll call all right so going from bottom to top karen i uh johanna i janet abstain okay jesse aye fred aye bruce aye and i'm an eye as well all right so that was S special permit one and so special permit two has to do with the extinguishing of the Zoning Board of Appeals Special Permit 90-7. Right. So we would have a motion to uh, ex to approve the special permit with no findings, with, with the conditions that are contingent, uh, that are have been drafted. Yeah, it's the other document, Pam. And hey, close the hearing. That seems relatively simple after all of this this evening. Bruce? I guess so moved. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll go ahead and second the motion. All right, uh, we'll roll call this. Bruce? Are you going to ask for any public? Oh yeah, I might as well ask again for a public hearing. Any any public comment on extinguishing the previous special permit? Okay, thank you. I don't see any hands from the public. Uh, all right, we'll go through the roll call. Bruce? Aye. Fred? Aye. Jesse. Aye. Uh, Janet. Uh, was that an aye? Yeah. Thank you. Johanna. Aye. Karen. Aye. I'm an aye as well. Seven votes in favor. All right. Uh, mm -hmm. Sharon and your team, thank you very much. Uh, I know it's been a long evening, but I think I wish you well. I can I just say so, you know, on behalf of everybody working on this project, uh, Rachel, you know, thank you for being here. Um, Jess, thank you for being here and for all of your work, but to the entire planning board and Chris, to you and your entire staff, wow. Um, thank you. This is an important project and it's so complicated and there are so many moving parts and you all, everyone on this Zoom screen, including all of the attendees, um, y'all are, are putting in, have put in a lot of work and I know there's more work to go and I just, I want you to know we don't take you for granted. We really appreciate the work and all the questions that that you've that you've asked and, and all the comments that you've made. And it's because of those that the project has gotten better and better. And so I just thank you all. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, the time is 10.09. And we can move on to item. Well, the next item on the agenda is the University Drive Potential Housing Overlay Zone. Uh, I'm going to suggest that we table this 
topic given the hour. Uh, I, my recollection is we put it on in case we might have time to discuss it. And I at least am feeling like we don't have time to discuss it this evening. Uh, so any, unless there's any objections, we can move on beyond that, that topic. All right, uh, not seeing any hands. The next item is old business not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance. Chris, Pam, do we have anything? I have no old business, yeah. Pam, no. No, okay. nothing. Likewise for new business? No new business. All right, how about uh, Form A and our subdivision applications? None. No. Okay, ZBA application? Yes, we have one. Um, let me share my screen because <clears throat> so this just came to my attention. It's actually going to go to the ZBA uh, December 14th. So this is a property known as 23 to 25 North Pleasant Street. You might be familiar with the it was formerly the Monkey Bar or the Lit, and most recently Hazel's. Um, there is a proposal to create a new establishment. So it would be a restaurant and a nightclub. It's not a change in use. Um, they're hoping to have two outdoor patios for dining. There would be a total capacity of 300 occupants. I did have a brief conversation with the building commissioner and you know he reiterated that this is not any sort of change in use it is a restaurant and club now um yeah there's always potential to have you know something arise that he told me that when um it was the monkey bar they learned that there can be a problem with the queuing um, in in the back once they put in those new apartments. I forget the name of them that are in the back there by the Boltwood garage parking area. So they they you know just changed the queuing and instead of queuing happening out back, it happens out front. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that project. And like I said, it's going to come before ZBA on December 14th. Okay. And that's uh, all I that's all I got. All right. Uh, do any board members particularly want to have this come to us at a at a future meeting? Um Doug, I, they, they won't be time, will they? No. I mean before it goes to ZBA. Well, we, we're not meeting until the again 20th. until after that. Yeah. yeah, so it sounds like never mind. Um, I personally, I don't think we need to see it anyway. No, neither do it's I. Not a, it's not really any change. It's a continuation uh, that needs a permit. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I think for those two reasons, why don't we just take a pass? But thanks for letting us know, Pam. You're welcome. Um, next item, time is 1013. Uh, upcoming SPP, SU special permit and S subdivision applications. Uh, Fred, I see your hand. Uh, yeah. Um, what about uh, the uh, Leverett Road uh, Kittredge development that I understand is will extend into Amherst? Uh, okay, that, yep. Uh, that is major. Yep. And uh, uh, I saw that in the in the Gazette too. Uh, yeah. My guess uh, is it's not anywhere near coming to ZBA or you know any other town permit yet. But Chris, what would be your perspective on that? Well, we're just starting to learn about this, um, and we're gathering information. Um, it's a big project. It's on the border of uh, Leverett. It's proposed to be a big project on the border of Lever Leverett and Amherst, but. I think I think that the um, proponents need to do a lot more work to, uh, you know, decide if this is the right place for this project. And as I said, we're just learning about it. So as 
you know, as, as we get more information, we'll share it with you. But right now, we really don't have a lot to share. Um, I think that the Leverett Planning Board will be hearing a presentation about this from the proponent on December 13th. So there will probably be, you know, more in the paper about it at that time. Um, but that's really all I have to offer right now. Yeah, that will be a walkthrough if any of you are interested. All right. So that's our that's our chance to go and see the Kittredge estate. Uh, actually, if I could interject, uh, that uh, the paper indicated that that walkthrough has been postponed. Okay. Well, maybe there was too much interest. Uh, Janet. Um, I. I don't understand that. I mean, I understand they wanted to connect to the sewer system and water of Amherst, but there is, is does the project take place? Will it take place per, possibly on Amherst land? Fred? Uh, does anybody know the answer to that? I guess my, yeah. uh, Chris, Chris, it sounds like you may. Yeah, from what I've seen, the there's probably 20% of the project that could occur on Amherst land, oh, but okay. the Amherst land isn't zoned for it. So, you know, I think that, the, as I said, the proponents have a long way to go to make this even a real proposal. Right. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, moving along, planning board committee and liaison, uh, Bruce, PVPC. Oh, you oh. didn't hear about <laughs> Upcoming site plan review. There are two of them. You skipped over that. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so we have Hickory Ridge trails, um, universally accessible trails coming up on the 20th of December. And then um, towards the end of January, you're also going to be holding a public hearing on the new um, elementary school, which is very exciting. So we just got that application in the door the other day and we're gonna be looking at that, but it's currently scheduled for um, January 17th. Okay. So that's it. Um, since you're gonna be closer to that than I am, do you, are they gonna do a traffic report as part of that application? I think they'll have to. Okay, and good. Gil I've heard some muttering, you know, that it's going to be a traffic challenge to have have it go on in that location. So uh, good. All right. Um, all right. So so again, I guess I can go on to the board and committee reports. Bruce, anything you want to say about PVPC? Uh, there's an upcoming meeting, but it hasn't happened in the past uh, two weeks. Okay. All right. Uh, CPAC, uh, I can say that we have had presentations from all 13 or 14 uh, applicants, and we have our public hearing to hear from the public about the applications tomorrow night. Uh, if you are interested, feel free to join. Um, and then we begin our deliberations in terms of how much to award to, to whichever applicants. So, Janet? Is there a place to see all the applications online or a summary, hopefully a summary? Or is there? I you... would think so. I have not looked for what's posted online. Uh, okay. there, is, there is a CPAC section of the town website. Okay. Uh, I think I think I have seen previous years stuff on the town website, so there should be stuff up there. Okay, uh, I can... Holly Drake is our uh, staff support, so if you don't see something, you could contact her and ask for the packet. Okay. Karen, uh, design review board. Nothing new to report. Okay, Chris, CRC. Um, the town council um, referred the solar bylaw to the CRC for further development. The um, solar bylaw working group has completed its work. They completed it on November 9th, and they have a draft of the solar bylaw. Um, it's not in its final form. It has all the substantive 
um, parts to it that the solar bother working group wanted to include, but it needs to be um, refined. And then it also needs to be reviewed by various staff members of the town, including the building commissioner and the fire uh, captain. It also needs to be reviewed by KP law. So um, when it gets to the community resources committee, they're going to be the, the body that carries it forward. And I'm hoping that I will be working with them. And anybody who cares about that um, bylaw should, you know, keep track of what the CRC is doing. So I think it's it's very exciting, but it's going to take a while. Okay. And I guess kind of on a related note, what, if anything, has happened with the proposed solar project that we saw a couple of months ago uh, on, was it, is it Shootsbury Road or whatever road? Kind of up yeah. that way. So that went to the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals twice, at least, once in August and once in October. Um, they're, unfortunately, their deline delineation of their wetlands expired in August. So they had to go back and have the delineation approved again by the CONCOM. And right now they're working on getting um, a third party reviewer to review the delineation so that the Conservation Commission can approve that delineation. And then once that happens, um, depending on whether the pr proposal is within CONCOM jurisdiction or not, um, it will either go to the CONCOM for a notice of intent or it won't. The next time the Zoning Board of Appeals sees it will be sometime in January. Right now it's scheduled for January 11th, but I think that is going to be changed because I think that uh, a couple of members of the Zoning Board of Appeals aren't available that night. So it's kind of in, I would say, I won't exactly say limbo, but it's kind of in a holding pattern right now until we figure out what the um, wet wetland delineation is. But meanwhile, the Zoning Board of Appeals is moving ahead to um, to get uh, third party reviewers to review some of the things that they need to decide upon. So we've put out RFQs where we're working on putting out RFQs um, for certain topics. And um, so that's that's what I can report. OK. All right. All right. Um, I guess that's all the committee and liaison reports. I do not have a report from the chair other than Thanks for sticking in around this evening for a long meeting. Uh, Chris, any report from staff? I don't have a report either, but thanks to Pam for holding us all together. And I kept shooting emails at her all day long with various documents and she kept up with it. And I really appreciate that. And I also appreciate all the planning board members um, work on this uh, library project. It's been a challenge, but um, Looks like we got through it. So thank you. Okay. Without yeah. you, our fearless leader. Right. Yes. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. All right. The time is 1023. Thank you all. We'll see you on the 20th, right? The next right. two weeks. That's correct. Yep. 20th. Okay. All righty. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, Pam.